Um, so this is me. We're going to talk about estimation of policy counterfactuals. Um, basically, is a I want to I, I want to think about this as a continuation of the stuff that Jeff was talking about. So what Jeff was focusing on is mostly what I'm going to call the evaluation problem. So we did some policy in the past, and we wanted to know how effective was this policy that we did in the past. So we have a model, and we have some treatment effect, where the treatment effect is going to be y1 minus y0, where y is the outcome that you got for the people that took the treatment, and y0 is the outcome for the people that didn't take the treatment. Now, there's a counterfactual problem for the people that took the treatment. You don't know what their y0 was. And for the people that didn't take the treatment, you don't know what their y1 is. But you have data on y0 and y1, at least for some subsection of the population population. I want to contrast that with the evaluation of a policy that has never been implemented. Okay, So here I want to think of it, which at some level is everything that we actually care about. Right? We can talk about what happened in the past, that that's not particularly useful if the past doesn't tell us anything about, anything about the future. What we really care about is if I implement some policy today, what's going to be the impact of that policy tomorrow. Um, so I want to think about policy effects now where why not is the current state of the world. This is the outcome that people get under the status quo. Why pi is the alternative outcome that they would, be, that they would get had some policy been enacted. Okay, so the key difference between what I'm going to be talking about, or you know, the, at least this way of thinking about it, and what Jeff talked about is we're not going to have any data on y pi at all. Okay, y pi is something, um, y pi is something that, that exists that that, that is, it, we're imagining in our mind. It's or, or somebody's written down on paper as a proposed policy, but it's never some, it's something that's never asked actually been estimated. So estimation of something like this is going to require some structure. So at some level, a lot of what I want to talk about is, I'll go backwards. So going backwards, here's, uh, I guess, here's an outline of what I want to talk about. Um, I want to start talking about structural and reduced form. So the, what, the advantages and disadvantages of structural and reduced form. What is structural? What is reduced form? How do we think about that? Um, so that's kind of going to be the first part of the class. Hopefully that's going to be fun and exciting and, and will be much more fun if it's a conversation rather than me just talking. Because um, this is, I'm certainly, I, I, I certainly expect stuff that you've heard about and thought about. So, so I would love to, love to make that more of a conversation. Um, I want to focus on two particular models. What all are the standard model that we think about, which is the simultaneous equations model, is kind of the classic model that we think about structural and reduced form. So I want to think about these things within the context of that model. And then I also want to talk about the generalized Roy model. And, and at some level, the generalized Roy model is the key model in labor economics. So when we think of, and, and in general, when we think about policy analysis, we think about treatment effect stuff. The generalized Roy model is the model, the economic model that we have in mind to think about this. So I want to think about these two models. So that's, that's going to be kind of fun and philosophical. And then we're going to get to identification. And I want to talk about non-parametric identification of things. There will be some philosophy about what identification means. But then it's going to get a little bit more boring. And it's going to be some math. And I apologize for those of you that aren't that, aren't that into that. Um, and then I want to talk about estimation. In particular, estimation of structural models. I want to think about there's really two main ways that people estimate structural models these days. One is maximum likelihood, and the other is simulation method. So simulated method of moments or indirect inference. So I want to talk about the two methods. I want to think about advantages and, and, and disadvantages of, of that. So if you're interested in that stuff, that part should be fun too. So fun, boring, and fun is kind of how I'm selling the lecture. Um, any questions so far? OK, I love this quote. So this is a quote from the Heckman article that was on the reading list. I, I, I'll let you read it rather than reading it out loud. And this, this is kind of the fundamental identification problem. right? We have data on stuff that happened. We want to talk about stuff that's going to happen. We're not, maybe some of us are, are economic historians, but for the most part, we're not. We're interested in policy. We're interested in doing stuff that's going to impact that's going to impact the future. We care about the past in the sense that it impacts the future, but we don't care about we don't care about the past per se. Well, if the future is different than the past, then there's not a whole lot to do. The only way that we can the only way that we can use the past to say something about the future is if the past is in some way similar to the future. 
Okay? And in this, some sense, this is, this is structure. This is what structural e econometrics or doing structural work is about. It's putting structure on the model so that you can use stuff that, that you saw in the past to say something about, about what's going to happen in the future. And the structure is kind of that part of it that's the same. Okay? I'll, I'll be a little bit more clear what I mean. Um, with that, so let so let me give you let me give you a couple examples, um, which the first one certainly should be familiar to most people. So I want to think about the classic uh, the classic supply and demand. So we have a supply curve that looks like this. We have a demand curve that it, we have a demand curve that looks like this. Um, two equations and two unknowns. I can solve for equations and unknowns, and I'm going to get the I'm going to get that solution, which you can also think about as the reduced form of the model. More on that later. Um, so, so, what, so, for an so an example of the sort of thing that we might be interested in is suppose that we have this market, it was untaxed, um, let it be the market for cigarettes or something like that, and now we come in and we want to impose a tax, okay? And we're going to impose the tax, we're going to impose the tax on the consumer, so now the effective price that I pay for the cigarette is not P, it's 1 minus tau times P. Okay? And I want to think about the impact of that tax. Now I'm going to have, now I'm going to have these, two, these two new equations, which are going to tell me the new price and the new quantity. Okay? So in order to evaluate the, in order to evaluate the effects of this, tax, of, this, of this tax, what do I need to do? If I want to evaluate and estimate the effect of the tax, what do I need? I need to estimate the structural parameters. Right, I need to estimate the gamma, the beta, the alpha, and the d. The, the, we can take expected values and the beta. Yeah, I, guess, I already said beta, I guess. We can take expected values of these things, because we maybe can't perfectly predict what the ut and the vt are. So we can at least get expected values of what the new prices and, and what the new quantities will do. But, th but that, requires, that requires estimating the structural parameters. Okay, And this is... Sense number one, and what's going to be important about structural parameters, what's a key assumption? What's, a key, what's the key assumption here when we're doing this? We impose the tax, we estimate the model, we impose the tax, we use the tax to simulate the thing. There's more than one key assumption, I suppose. But what, what really is the key assumption that allows me to do this? Yeah. The, the demands remain linear? Li they remain linear, but it, even more than that. Not only do they remain linear, but the same beta, the same, the same gamma, the same alpha, and the same, and the same alpha. There's two alphas. The same alphas, the same beta, and the same gamma. In other words, the parameters are policy invariant. Okay? And that's, in one sense, the key, one of the key definitions of structure is that when I change the policy, the parameters that I estimated are still going to be relevant. If as soon as I impose, if as soon as I impose a new policy, you fundamentally change the way that we think. I mean, suppose that introducing the, the policy makes people think that cigarettes are bad. They didn't know cigarettes are bad before. They stopped consuming, and they're not, only res they're not only responding to the prices, but they're responding to the information as well. That would be a case where this wouldn't work. The, the parameters wouldn't be policy invariant. The, 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 the change in the tax change the demand for cigarettes not only through the price, but also through this information campaign or whatever. Okay? So uh, the key assumption the key, I, I'll, I'll call it the key. The key assumption that allows us to do this is that the parameters of the model are, are policy invariant. That is, when I change the tax rate, I don't change the alpha, the, the alpha is the beta, and the, and the gammas remain the same. Okay, the second model I want to think about is what I'm going to call the generalized Roy model, which is a little bit different than what Heckman calls the generalized Roy model. Um, I want to start with I want to start with the Roy model, and I, I people that know me will know that I don't think I've never taught a class in my whole entire life without teaching the Roy model. I can't. I, this is my favorite thing in the world. Um, I picked it up a little bit from 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 my advisor Jim Heckman here, and and I've kept with it. Even when I'm teaching like undergraduate classes, uh, they don't know it's the Roy model, but but it's actually it's it's actually the Roy model. Um, this, the simple version of the Roy model, it's in some ways, and this will be a little bit of a theme um, that you'll see later on when we get to identification, in some ways this is the simplest economic model we could possibly ever write down. 
Estimation of the model is incredibly difficult and requires really, really, really strong assumptions if we want to com completely non-parametrically estimate the model. Okay, it, so it's an overly simple model. Even though it's an overly simple model, it's still going to be. It's going to still be. Uh, to, it's going to still turn out to be really, really hard um, to non-parametrically identify. So we have two. We have two. We have two occupations. We, you can either be a hunter or you can be a fisherman. I did, there might be, I probably screwed up this, I did something last night that you should never do, which is last night this did not say the generalized Roy model, it said the Roy model, and I decided I don't want to teach the Roy model, I want to teach the generalized Roy model, so I completely redid the slides to talk about the generalized Roy model, so there's probably going to be some, I'll probably screwed up at some point. Um, but this is the generalized Roy model. So, so I, I live in this little village. I can do two things. I can fish or I can hunt. Um, fish and rabbits are gonna be, can be completely homogeneous. Um, there's not going to be another key, a key thing here. There's no uncertainty in the number that I catch. I know whether I'm a good hunter and I know whether I'm a good fisherman. And I just choose to do whatever I, whichever I prefer. The price of fish is going to be pi f. The price of rabbits is going to be is going to be um, is going to be pi r. So wages, I basically am going to get paid efficiency units. So the, my wage is essentially going to be the number of fish that I that I catch times the price of fish. Um, the, 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 my wage as a hunter is going to be the number of rabbits that I catch um, times uh, the, the price of rabbits. I, Je Jeff talked about the Roy model. I, this, was, this is one of these first examples of a counterfactual I think that Jeff mentioned in his lecture. Is the, the, by the way, the Roy paper, it's so, you should, I don't, did I put that on the reading list? I, it's a really cool, fun paper to read. He wrote this paper like in the 50s, back when you weren't supposed to use very much math. So he, he wrote down this model. He assumed log normal utility. He derived all of the equations. He explicitly got all of the math done. And then he rewrote the whole thing, explaining it in words with no math at all. And it reads like a, it reads like a bedtime story. It's a very, I mean, <laughs> I, so, I mean, it reads at the level of a bedtime story. It might not be something you want to read to your kids as they go to bed. Um, but it's a really cool read. I mean, it's, it, it won't take you very long, but, it, but I strongly recommend it. In the basic Roy model, so it's not quite, the model that I'm going to think about is not quite the simplest model in the world. And the simplest model of the world is the basic Roy model where people just use the high, the, just choose the occupation that gives them the highest wage. I'm going to generalize it slightly by assuming they're going to choose the occupation that gives them the highest utility. So this is the utility that I get. This is the utility I get as a fisherman. If I if I fish, this is the wage that I get as uh, this is the wage that I get as a hunter. So this is my utility as a hunter. So I'm just going to choose whichever option gives me the, gives me the higher level of utility, and that's it. Okay, that's that's the the whole model. So questions about it? I could talk a lot more about the Roy model, but I don't I don't really want to. Um, well, I do want to, but I'm talking about econometrics rather than labor now. Um, prices in fish are going to be taken as given, and this will be important for the structure. So this is me very much of a partial equilibrium kind of analysis when we think about policies here. So when we do things like change when we change when we change uh, welfare policies or something like that, we're not going to be thinking about the prices of fish and hunting. The the price of fish and rabbits is changing. But one could put this into an equilibrium model where you would worry about worry about that as well, and it wouldn't be that hard. Okay, so we just take prices as given, um, and that's it. That's the whole model. Okay, so why is this all of labor Why is this all of labor economics? It feels like all of labor economics back in you know 1430 or something like that, when all the people did was hunt and fish. Now now people do a lot more. Um, people do a lot more than hunt and fish. But this basic framework, it doesn't really matter. Most things that we decide in labor are um, binary choices. So often we're doing one thing or another. So it could be hunting and fishing. It could be any other two occupations. You can think about it as blue collar occupations, as white collar occupations. A super important example is you could think about working and no and non-working, where where the, I mean the only thing is what is the wage that you receive if you don't work. You could either think about that as zero is one way of thinking about it, or you can think that the option is not is not it's not leisure or work, it's home production or um, it's home production or market production, and then you can think about the wage as essentially home production. 
Okay, so you can think about this as, as going for work or no work. You can think about being employed in the market or being self-employed. You could think about really famous paper by Willis and Rosen where they think about whether I want to graduate from college or whether I want to be a high school graduate. And I can think about there, the, you would think about the wage that I would get as a high school graduate and the wage that I would get as a college graduate. I can choose whichever one gives me, gives me higher lifetime income. Um, I could be a school teacher or a stockbroker. Um, going back to stuff that Jeff was talking about, I can think about entering a job training program or keep working. So I currently have a job. I can keep my job, or I could, or I can enter a job training program. Right now, I have two options. Extending it to three options just makes everything I talk about that's already hard is just going to get harder. Okay, and it's going to get harder in very intuitive ways. So, so focusing on the two choice models is, is going to be very similar to, to more than two choices. Okay, any other questions? Um, and, and almost, I mean, as soon as you, I, I mean, at some level, as soon as I say work, no work, and I say what policies might I be interested in, you should be able to each of you rattle off um, 10 social policies in, 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 in a minute. Um, so any, any kind of labor market policy, any kind of redistributed policy, we can think about this model to, 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 um, to predict things. Yeah. One interesting feature of the generalization you showed is the difference in utility functions that are subscripted, or Fisher say. Or right. And what kinds of intuitions do labor economists have about the relevant different utility functions that people face between things of interest, whether that's unemployment or not? It seems like they could look So, okay, there's, there's two, it seems like there's two, there's two parts of your question. One part is, what do I think about the fact that F is different than R? Um, I'm going to think about that as being super, I mean, that's going to be super important for something like this example, right? So you might think that being a school teacher is very rewarding, it, it, unless you've actually been a school teacher, and then I think it's actually a pain in the butt. Um, but, but I think ideally we think about being a school teacher or a social worker or a minister or something like that is a very rewarding thing. We're willing to take a lower wage in order to do, do that as opposed to being a lawyer or stockbroker or something like that, which is going to be more, which is going to be more boring. Um, so we might think that it, we might think that. Uh, I don't like fishing or hunting, so I can't, I don't know which one you, you would have to pay me more to do. Um, actually, fishing would be, so fishing, so in the, in the Roy model, it actually matters some, fishing is hard and hunting is easy, which is kind of the opposite you might think about it. So hunting is, hunting is like hunting for rabbits. So you go out, you set a cage, you, set, you go out and you set a cage, and then you go back, and then the next day you see if there's a rabbit in the cage or not. So, so it's kind of boring. Why, why fishing, think about like fly fishing where you, you're doing all the fancy stuff with that. So, so that's probably more fun than this, which means that in order to compensate me for the, for the boring job, you're going to have to pay me a little bit more to do this job than I would to do this job. So if WF was equal to WR, I would probably choose to be a fisherman. So that's the, to me, that's the, the biggest interesting thing about the fact that these things are different. And there aren't like other implicit variables in here or something. What? really just in terms of the wage. Is that right? The way it's written, there are functions of the wage. Right. The way it's written that there's function in the wage. I mean, the kind of models that people are going to write down are going to end up looking at something like some function of consumption plus x prime beta plus epsilon, right? I mean, it, it's always x prime beta plus epsilon at the end of the day. So the kind of, the kind of things that people typically estimate are going to look something like this. OK? Um, So there's another question. That, there's another question that you might. So in in the standard model, it's going to look something like this. The U is going to be the same. So your the way that you value consumption might be the same in both fishing and hunting. Okay, there's been some really interesting examples where that if you if the slope of the utility function varies with the job that you're doing, um, then you can get some then you can get some really interesting things going on. Yeah, I don't want to get, I'm not, what I'm going to be looking at is going to, in fact, it's going to be even simpler. The model that I'm going to be looking at is going to look like that. Um, but, but there's super, there's lots of interesting things you could do beyond that. Okay, any of the, somebody else had their hand up. 
No? Okay. Um, yeah, so here are different wages that I can think about. Minimal, different policy I can think about. Minimum wage, Medicaid, EITC, TANF. Anything that I want is going to tend to, any, anything that I want to think about is going to tend to distort these to sort these decisions. It's sort of obvious with labor supply that if I start giving people money for not, you know, if I say start giving, giving money to people that you get if you're not working, that's going to tend to discourage work. But, it, but it's also going to discourage things like being a, it's going to affect college versus high school decision. It might affect being a school teacher versus being a stockbroker, et cetera. Okay, so there's lots of different policies that I might want to think about. And most of these models, I'm going to have something like the Roy model to think about it. Um, okay, so, so that's the Roy model, and the, so that's the Roy model, and the, comp the Roy model and the, and the simultaneous equations model. So now I want to get into a little bit of the philosophy. And there's terms, I, I, there's terms here that mean different things to different people, and I don't know what the right, I, if I were king, I might suggest different ways to think about things. Um, but people use these words, and I think they mean very different things to different people. So let me talk about the word structural. So the question is, what does the word structural mean? Um, it's actually, it, it's actually, the way that things work now, if you pay attention and you think about it hard, it's really kind of confusing. It doesn't make any sense. Because back in the, the, when we first learned structural and reduced form stuff, it was probably in the context of the simultaneous equations model, where running regression was the reduced form, and doing IV was, the, was structural. So IV is structural and reduced form, and regressions are reduced form. But now, if you look at somebody who does IV, they say, oh, I'm an IV person. I do reduced form work. Okay, which doesn't, which doesn't really make all that much sense. Um, so what, what are definitions of structural and reduced form? Simplest definition is structural parameters are the parameters in a simultaneous equations model. At some level, when we learn structural and reduced form, that's where it comes from, um, and, the, and those are often the terms that we mean. My favorite definition, if I were king and got to choose the definition, my favorite definition would be the, would be the first one. To me, structural, what structural means is that the parameters that you're estimating are policy invariant. Okay, which means, we talked about this before, that means if I change the policy, the parameters don't change. Okay? Um, The other definition, and I think this has become the definition that people mean these days. Usually, I, these days, if you do, if you do simultaneous equations, you do two IVs, and you say, I'm estimating demand curve versus supply curve, people are not going to call that structural. Typically what, we think about, what, typically, what we think about as being structural today means you have to write down a maximizing model where either people are maximizing utility or firms are maximizing profits. And, and the parameters that are going to be structural are going to be fundamentally preference parameters and technology parameters. So I want to estimate a production function. I want to estimate a utility curve. The parameters and utility curve, the parameters in the utility model are structural. The parameters in the in the, production, in the production function are structural. Anything else is not structural. Okay, so structural purists, I think, will often think about this. Uh, this is the definition of, of structural. These two kind of don't really, I mean, what, two and three are kind of different, right? I mean, two and three seem like, like, I mean, when you're estimating a demand curve, you're not, at, a demand curve is, is not preferences, right? It's what, it, it comes from preferences, but it's not fundamentally preferences itself. Um, but I can think about, that, but, but that doesn't necessarily contradict one, because I can think about that as being policy invariant, okay? This thing, th th these two kind of mix well together because I, I think the utility parameters and technology parameters, um, utility parameters and technology parameters, they, they make sense that those things would be policy relevant. Those are something fundamentally, uh, there's something fundamentally involved in the firm's production process or fundamentally involved in my decision making when I make decisions. So it makes sense that those would be policy invariant. Um, but do they have to be? There's a, did you, yeah. You also say the purpose is to kind of recover the deep parameters. So with regard to like deep parameters, you think they're going to 
the first definition or maybe more? Significant? This is exactly what they mean. I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think when people say deep parameter, this is what they mean. They mean preference parameters and technology parameters. So these are the fundamental parameters that, that aren't going to change, okay? Um, but are those two exactly the same? Do we always want to think about um, do we always want to think about preference parameters as being policy invariant? Probably not. It depends. It depends on the policy. It depends on the policy that we're thinking about. If we want to think about having a tax for peanuts and we want to impose a tax for an excise tax for peanuts. Um, that's probably not going to change people's preferences. It's probably a pretty reasonable assumption then that if we just change the tax policy on peanuts, um, that that's not going to estimate, the, that's not going to affect the production function of peanuts fundamentally or the preference for peanuts fundamentally. However, if we go into, if we, if we go into a preschool and we teach fire safety, presumably the only reason why we teach fire safety, well, okay, it's information, but, but it's to get, it's to get, it's, it's to, ascent. that was a bad example because it really is information more than it, more than it is preferences. Um, but we do things like advertise to, to young children how smoking is bad, um, how, how you don't, you grow up and it's going to, it's going to, it's going to make you, it's going to make you sick and you, and you don't want to do that. That's fundamentally trying to change people's preferences. So especially for children, but even for adults sometimes, we definitely have policies where part of the point of the policy is in order to change people's preferences. Okay? And that's preferences. There's lots of exotic, I mean, as soon as you think about growth theory, you can think about technology as being endogenous. So fundamentally, and you know, Asamoglu has a bunch of papers, Asamoglu has papers on everything, but he's, you know, some, of his, some of his early papers were, were on this idea that, that technology itself is, is, is endogenous. And fundamentally, when you think about growth, that's what we're thinking about. We're thinking about technology um, as being endogenous. Um, so what's the, what's the point here? The point here, and part of the reason that I like this question, or this definition of it, is whether a parameter is policy invariant or not depends on the policy that you're interested in. There are some, there are some parameters that they're going, to seem, they're going to seem policy invariant to policy A, but not policy invariant to policy B. Okay, so when you're thinking about this work, not only that, I mean, preference parameters at the end of the day actually are reduced forms, right? What, it, what's, what are preference parameters? There's some reduced form for how the brain works. If we really, if we really want the deep parameters, we would be have, we'd have to map how the synapses in the brain are firing with different types of stimulus, right? So if we really, really want deep structural parameters, utility functions aren't deep structural parameters. The deep structural parameters are the map of the brain and how the, and how the, how the synapse fire. Synapses all all fire. Um, so whether you think about something, and obviously, if you think about brain surgery, or I don't know the. If you think about you know giving somebody a lobotomy or something like that, right? Then you th that's that's a policy that's probably going to change. That's probably going to change preferences. Um, so very much the the whether I the way I like to think about it is I like definition number one. Um, when you're thinking about doing this kind of work, I think that's a good definition to think about. A key thing is that whether a parameter is policy invariant depends on the parameter. However, you know, I think in the way, usually when people say structural, they mean something like the second bullet point, unless they're talking about a simultaneous equations model in which they mean the third bullet point. Okay, so that's structural. Um, I think when you said the first one, you said parameters from the SEM are policy invariant. Let me say it again. I thought you said that with respect to the first one, you were talking about a simultaneous equations model. Or did no. You use that as and more generally, okay. any structural model that I write down, right? Call, calling it stru yeah, calling it structure, and let, let, even even the most reduced form, like you know, Josh Angris would not think of himself, um, would not think of himself as structural, but as soon as you write down this model. Right? As soon as you write down this, this is, this is structural. 
right? So if you think of, within the context of what I'm thinking about, if you think about the kind of stuff that Jeff was talking about, when we change the policy, we might we change whether you we, we change whether you get the treatment or not. So we're changing that, but we're fundamentally not changing the outcome that you would get under the, under the treatment, which is the, sut the SUTFA assumption, um, if, you, if you know the stable unit treatment to somebody. Uh, B, what's V stand for? Value, yeah. Th that's essentially a structural assumption, right? It's structural in the sense that it, you're making the assumption that this is your model, this is your economic model. This economic model does not change when you change the policy. So even things that call themselves reduced form are making structural type assumptions when I think about structure in, in, in the first bullet point. OK, for that matter, what does reduced form mean? Um, and here I'm going to here I'm going to take like structure. I don't I like the first one, but I'm, I'm not going to fight that battle. I, here I might fight the battle if if anybody listened to me. Um, reduced form. The, what the meaning of reduced form is completely changed to what it originally meant. Okay, and I think now it means something that doesn't have any content, and I and I don't like that. Um, so what I think my preferred definition of the reduced form is the kind of reduced form is what I would get from the simultaneous equations model. So what is a reduced form? What is a, what is what is a reduced form? A reduced form parameters are known functions of structural parameters. Okay, so you write down a structural model. You reduce the the, re, the reduced form model is reduced from the structural model. So the reduced form parameters are, are some known combination of structural parameters. Often the reduced form parameters might be identified, and the structural parameters are not. You know, in the in the classic case, without an instrument, I can identify the reduced form parameters. I can't identify the structural parameters, but I could go the other way. If I knew all the structural parameters, I could figure out what the reduced form parameters are. So to me, that's a, that's a, that's a better definition of reduced form. That was the original definition of reduced form. We've gotten away from it, and, and it's sort of too bad because it actually has content. There are times, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, you can use reduced form analysis to estimate the effect of a policy that's never been implemented. So there are cases in which you don't need the full structural model to do, for some policies, you don't need the structural model to do all of the policy analysis. You can use the reduced form to do that. And maybe only the reduced form is identified, and that's OK. OK? However, in order to say everything I just said, you had to write down the structural model to begin with. Right, so that's the sense in which it has content. You're writing down a structural model. You're thinking about this is the data generating. This is the data generating process, um, and then then you have a formal result about what a reduced form parameter is. It's a known function of structural parameters. That's fundamentally different than what reduced form means, which is I do whatever the heck I want, and if I didn't write down a structural model, I call it reduced form. Okay, that's the term that we use, and I don't like it very much because this this actual this other term actually means something. Um, the way that we typically use it um, does doesn't mean very much. Okay, does that kind of make sense? The phrase that I like um, much better is design-based work. So I, so what I want to do is I want to I want to. I want to compare advantages and disadvantages of structural work versus design-based work. OK? Um, and a couple caveats. The first one is, it's, it, the first one is it, I think it's non-controversial, especially the way that, I, that I've written it. Um, but the fact that, there, to me, the fact that, there, that I think there's advantages and disadvantages means that they're complements rather than they're complements rather than substitutes. I think the best empirical work, best empirical researchers today are not only doing structural stuff or not only doing reduced form stuff. They're using not only doing design-based stuff. Uh, they're, they're using whatever method it best answers the question that they're, that they're interested in. And really good structural papers will include really good design-based stuff 
in really good design-based stuff in them. So I don't, and that, you know, in some ways that might be the theme of the lecture, is that we have this structural, and I, I'm kind of setting it up, is we have this structural versus reduced form debate. So we think that there's these big arguments between structural people and, 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 and design-based people. And I don't think that's, A, I don't think it's totally accurate. I think most people, most people recognize the advantages and disadvantages of both. Um, and if they don't, I think that they should. I don't think that the, it, it, it depends on the question that you're trying to you're trying to answer. If you're trying to answer the evaluation question, that is, what happened what happened last year? How effective was this policy? I don't need a structural model to answer that question, and that's an interesting question. If I want to estimate the effect of a policy that's never been implemented, I have to have some structure in order to do that. Almost by definition, I can't answer that without structure. And that's certainly something that we can't give up as an economist, as, as economists, as a, as a, or social scientists as a, as a whole. This is fundamentally why we're doing the kind of research we're doing is because we want to influence. We want to influence policy. If you want to get real bottom line, here's what I think the effect of a policy is going to be and get an actual number that you can justify, you need some structural assumptions. You need some structural assumptions in order to do that. Okay? Um, the other thing I'm saying, and talk about, are you going to talk about advantages and disadvantages? That doesn't mean that all structural work is better than all design-based work in this dimension or the other, right? It's there's crappy papers and good papers. There's lots of crappy structural papers. There's lots of great structural papers. There's lots of crappy design-based papers. There's lots of great design-based papers. So, so of course there's there's variation within these categories. Okay, any questions about this? So here, here is how I would, um, here is how I might phrase it. I, I think at some level, um, I don't know if th this is an advantage or a diff. Yeah, I, I think at some point, the first time that I presented this, I called it advantage versus disadvantage. Now I'm going to talk about differences. Um, to me, a fundamental difference between the typical way people do design-based stuff and the typical way that people do structural stuff is design-based work tends to be more focused on internal validity. So you got, does everybody know internal, val internal validity means given, internal validity given, means given the sample and the policy and the, the parameter that I'm trying to estimate, do I estimate this parameter in the right way using the particular design that I, ha that I have in mind, okay? The, the external validity is saying, does this apply to any other policy in any other context in any other, in any other population, okay? So, so design-based stuff means, focuses almost exclusively on internal validity. So the question is, we have a parameter, we have something we want to estimate, how well do we estimate it? We need to, we need to deal with this selection issue in order to, in order to, issue, in order to estimate it. That's going to be a really, really difficult thing to do, um, so we have to come up with some nice way to, to deal with that. Structural stuff tends to be more focused on external validity. So structural stuff is typically much more interested in thinking about what might happen in some other context than it is interested in what happened, um, what happened, what's what happened in the for this one parameter. Um, what that often leads to is that design-based stuff, and this is you know this is this is a little bit is the trade-off. Design-based stuff usually you're interested in one parameter. Right? What was the effect of this program on this outcome? So one treatment effect. Maybe you have a couple different outcomes, but, but it's, a very small, it's a very small number of parameters. And the whole point of your paper is aimed at, your, is aimed at some design that's going to give you quasi-random estimation that's going to allow you to estimate this one parameter. Okay? Typically, when we're interested in something like policy counterfactuals, that doesn't depend on one parameter. It depends on a bunch of parameters. Typically, we have to write, typically we have to write down a full model. Our full model is going to have lots of different parameters in it. In order to estimate the effect of the policy counterfactual, we have to estimate all of these parameters. Okay, so there's going to be some trade-off that if I only, it's much easier to nail one parameter if I only have to estimate one parameter than to nail 20 parameters if I have to estimate 20 parameters. And that's a little bit of the trade-off between here. If you want to write a really good design-based, I realize I'm opposite, 
as I'm talking, this is the design-based stuff and this is the structural stuff, but on the slide, it's the other way around, so sorry about that. Um, so I'll, I'll try to do it this way. So if you're on, if you're on the design-based stuff, if you want to convince people you have a really good paper, you've got to do a really good job of nailing the parameter. Okay? If you're more on the structural side, you've got a bunch of different parameters you've got to estimate. It's, you, it's, you, it's going to be hard to nail every single one of them, so there's going to be a little bit of a trade-off. You, you can't perfectly identify every single parameter in your model um, in, a, in one paper, right? That's sort of a lifetime's work to, in order to do that. So that's another trade-off. I think an, a, another... Something else, there, there's a phrase that design-based people use. That, uh, this is another one of these phrases that people use that, that means different things to different people that bothers me, which is identification, right? So design-based stuff, design-based people say that they're, they're better at identification. Um, I actually don't think that, I don't think that's really true. I think that, to me, identification is going from the model to the data. Okay, where, where I think that, saying, so this is the data, this is the model, what I want to stick in here is the estimates. So often in design-based stuff, the map between the data and the numbers that you get is much clearer. Okay, it's partly because you're only estimating one parameter, um, so we can spend a lot more, it's much clearer exactly how you're estimating this one parameter. So when you're doing design-based stuff, this map between the data and the parameter that you get is often very clear. However, what you, you, don't even, you don't even have this model so often. So what the parameter means is somewhat confusing. You're estimating a parameter, but exactly what it is, typically you don't know. And often it's something like a treatment effect. And what is a treatment effect? The treatment effect is the effect of a program on an outcome. What's a program? A program is a super complicated thing that's got all kinds of stuff going on. So even interpreting what this thing means sometimes um, is difficult. So one advantage to me of writing down the model is it helps me in interpreting what this parameter means. So to me, identification is getting from here to here. The structural stuff tends to be get better at this dimension and often poor at this dimension. Often, if you're, if you're a reader of the paper, it's hard to know what in the data led to the parameters that you got in the model, and that makes it hard to interpret, right? I mean, especially if you're a design-based person, and you're, very, you're used to thinking about this very clearly, and then you see a structural paper with lots of parameters, you know where they came from, it's, it's sort of harder to read the paper. So, so this is an advantage and a disadvantage of these two things. Any, you guys are... This is the sort of thing that I w it would be more fun as a conversation than as a lecture. So any other thoughts or, yeah? My experience, identification is often used to refer to like your internal validity. Right. right. And, and that's why I'm not sure I understand how that relates to what you're saying you know, here. So that's why it's so internal validity is saying I got a valid estimate. Internal validity is exactly saying I have a valid estimate of this parameter. But what does this parameter mean? We're not saying anything about it. To me, not, you know, not, to, probably not to Josh Angrist, I don't think, but to me, that's part of identification, is understanding what the parameter that I'm estimating actually means. Yeah? So one might think that it's not possible to have external validity without internal validity. You could have internal validity alone, yeah. but then you couldn't. You see what I mean? Absolutely. No, 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 no. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, it's not that, it's not that, uh, yeah, I, I, it's not that, uh, it's not that this thing can't, you don't need to worry about internal validity. And it's not like here, you, I mean, here, you care about, these guys certainly care about external validity, and these guys certainly care about internal validity. But what you're saying is absolutely right, right? I mean, if you don't have, inter if you don't have internal validity, then you don't have external validity, right? O virtually for sure. So, yeah. Yeah, I completely, I completely agree with that. And that's why, you know, I'm trying to say more emphasis. That doesn't mean zero emphasis. Um, it certainly doesn't mean zero emphasis here, and it, it certainly doesn't mean zero emphasis there either. Yeah. Uh, so how, how do you uh, judge the confidence that it has in the structural models? For example, in Ivan Bates, you have a sense of how significant the coefficients are. But in a structural one, you can see how significant I don't think that, I don't, here I don't know if it's all that different. 
right? So it depends on the context of, if all you're doing is running an experiment and you're pretty sure the experiment, and you're pretty sure the experiment went well, then you're kind of in good shape, okay? In any other, in a, almost any other context, you're not going to have that much confidence either way. So, so even on the internal, even on the internal validity, you have an instrument, right? And you got to believe that your instrument is good. Do I know that my instrument? Do, just from one study, do I know whether the instrument is good? No, I don't. Um, if, if I'm doing regression discontinuity, I gotta, you know, I don't have, I, I have to pick a bandwidth. Is that bandwidth, what is the bias that I get from the bandwidth? I don't really know. Um, so, so, so with, I think it's true with both, almost any kind of econometric technique that you're doing. As long as you're using some sort of econometrics, pure experiment, maybe, maybe that's clean, but almost anything else, as long as you're doing some econometrics, you're making some assumption somewhere, and, and typically it's an untested assumption. So how much, confident do you, how much confidence do you have is going to depend completely on the context. So if I have a great instrument, I re might really believe this. If, you know, if I have a great instrument, I might really believe this. If I have a crappy instrument, I might not. Now, all that said, internal validity is generally easier than ex I mean, the, the, con the, the converse of, what, of, the, of the point Trevor was making, internal validity in some ways is easier than external validity. So if all you're interested in is in internal validity, it's a little bit easier to be confident about internal validity than external validity. So that's true. But, but I think in general, this is an issue with kind of all, anytime we do any kind of statistical analysis, we need to make some assumptions and we never know for sure. The way that you evaluate is the same way that you would evaluate these kinds of things. Um, you know, so for example, and I think this was stuff that Jeff talked about, um, if you want to evaluate evaluation methods for design-based stuff, often you would compare what you do to what you would get out of an experiment, okay? People have done the same stuff with structural models. So you can take a structural model, you can use your structural model to predict some policy change, and then you can look at the actual, you know, sometimes people will do this. They will estimate there is a policy change in 1990. They'll estimate their data through 1988. They will use their model to predict the effect of the policy change, and then they'll see how well they do. Okay? So that's the sort of thing that you can do, which is not really, it's not really that different. That, I, I don't know if that's a fundamental difference between the two. Um, yeah. The researcher decides which, yeah, you got to write, it's, this is a question of modeling. So you're going to write down a model, you're going to decide what the model is. Yeah, and that's what research, right, that's, that's exactly the sorts of things that we're going to argue about in seminars is, did you include this or did you not include this? And yeah. Absolutely. Right. I'm going to say it a different way. Almost, almost by definition, I mean, almost, the word model almost means by definition something's going to be left out. If it was, then it wouldn't be a model. It would be the world. So you always got to leave something out. The ch how important, now the, how important, it, hopefully, it de now it depends on your definition of what important is, right? Hopefully the most important things you've included in your model. Um, but, yeah, but often research would be easy if it was easy to write down a model that was give you, if everybody always believed your model and everybody believed every assumption that you made. Um, pip people typically don't and there's lots of stuff to include and often it's too hard to include everything that we want to include. So Right. 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 And 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 you're saying something that I'm probably going to say again later. But it's super. This this is almost, like when you're thinking about this stuff. 
Um, it, it, almost if you take one thing away from me, take, take, take this away. What it is that's important to put in your model depends on the question you're trying to answer. So for some questions, including some stuff is important. For other questions, including other stuff is important. So it's not, it's not, I might write down my model to answer one question. You're interested in a different question. I might, we might have totally different models of the same thing, but we're interested in different policies. So there's different things, there, there's different things that we're worried about. Right? Why do you and I uh, two different models the same uh, problem? What? Uh, me. <laughs> no. Um, I, I mean, so the, this, uh, that, I mean, to some extent, that's what macroeconomics is. So macroeconomics, um, they spend years and years and years and years. It's, that's what it is. It's kind of different models because they don't have very much. Labor and macro are sort of the opposite, and we have, we have the Roy model and lots of data, and they have lots of models and very little data. So they spend lots and lots of time arguing about exactly what the right model is. Hopefully the data can distinguish. I mean, what you want is that if you have a model, what we want ideally is you have your model, I have my model. Um, let me say this and then back off it a little bit. You have your model, I have my model. We have data. Let's test which model is better. For me, for me, I don't like thinking about the world that way because probably my, my it's pro, there's probably a better model that would that would incorporate the best parts of you and the best parts of my model, and you know the next person is going to come along and improve on both of them. That's, I think, what would be ideal. So they don't necessarily contradict. Then you got to then use data to test them, right? So that's a classic, you know, sort of classic. In some ways, that's that's like classic science, right? Is we have we have different models have different hypotheses, and we want to test the hypotheses. If we reject it, we we reject the model, and we write down a different model. Yeah. I mean, so it's, a, the question of external validity and it's exact, the question of like, is it actually useful <laughs> for people making policy? Because like, I can go to a school, I can take side, like, a uh, science-based model in Chicago and go to Pittsburgh and say, oh, this had a positive, significant effect, so maybe this program will work in Pittsburgh too, being similar enough. Whereas when you have a structural model, it's like, the people who have the training or even process the assumptions that you're making are pretty limited. Yeah. I'm just curious, like, if you think, like, there's ways for, like, that communication gap to, I don't know, it seems, like, pretty attractive to me. I, I mean, everyone gets trained in that Yeah, I think at some level you're talking about this, right? right? Um, the map from the data to the parameters is more transparent. Are structural models useful for doing policy analysis? There's one clear example where they are, which is monetary policy, right? I mean, monetary policy is a case where structural models, um, I mean, how structural they are, people can argue. I mean, some people, depending on what you call deep parameters, whether those are deep parameters or not, people are going to argue about. But at some level, you know, using econometric models to predict for forecasting is how we do monetary policy. So at some level, if you, you know, if, at some level, you don't have any choice, right? You got, you got to use, you got to use these things. I, I, I'm sympathetic to the idea that. I mean, I tend to estimate. I, I tend to estimate structural models. I'm very aware of the fact that the models that I estimate are hard to read by people by people in Washington. Um, yeah, but yeah, is that was that any? Does that? Yeah, no, does I'm that, just curious if you had any like, you know, strong perspective on that. I, I, I mean, in ideal world, you would get enough academics that can read and understand things that can communicate to policymakers that this is the this is the consensus of the profession, and hopefully that will make that will make some impact on, on, on actual decision makers. I mean, there's some questions. I mean, there's lots of questions that fundamentally, I mean, for, simple, for some policies, yeah, we can look at 
we can, we, can, we can do lots of valuations. But there's lots of questions, like monetary policy is an example. The only way that economists can influence monetary policy is using some sort of a structural model. We can't, you know, we don't have lots and lots of US's where we can, where we can randomly try different monetary policy and, and see what happens to growth 200 years later, right? So, so for, lots of, for lots of policies, we don't really have any choice. Um, Somebody who hasn't asked a question. Yeah. Yeah. So here, um, so far it seems a very, uh, it's like either structural or design based, but I think we have like a, I think we have a way to make both, right? To make both means. Yes. Yes. I will talk about that. Yes. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, in the end of the day, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of, if you take, I already said, if you take one thing away, um, that's what it would be. So, so I can't say that a second time. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I started by saying the the best, I, I mean, I think that there's a, there's stuff going on right now um, that's kind of exciting, which is combining the best from, from both worlds, right? So ideally we can use nice design based experiments to inform the parameters of the structural model, right? Yeah. Right. It would be something like that. So I do some. I do. I mean, the, I, an example is I do an experiment. I get a result of the experiment. When I estimate the parameters of the structural model, I force the parameters of the structural model to to replicate the results that I get from the experiment. Okay, so that, this is an area that people, I think, it's sort of, a, to me, an exciting new area that, that, I don't know if it's new, but it's an area where people are kind of are kind of pushing. Um, yeah. Like along the science side, you think you've got Chris Walters in mind, right? Like right. With the charter schools and the structural model. And exactly. That. Yeah, so Chris Walters was, yeah, he, he started with an experiment, and then he used the experiment to, to, to build He's kind, yeah, there's, two, there's kind of two ways to do it. Um, I mean, what, I think what Walters did was started with the experiment and then said, you know, what can I estimate beyond the experiment and wrote down a very simple model, but a model that's very well identified and very clearly identified from the, from, from the experiment. Um, that's one way to go. The other way to go is the, the other way is harder. If you write down your general structure, the, the, you again have, so A, a I, think, I think this is a great idea. I think it's exciting. But this other problem, it, you still have this problem. You have a lot more parameters. So if you've got 30, it's car, if you've got one, it's hard to come up with 30 different experiments to estimate all 30 of your structural parameters. Um, but yeah, there's lots of, there's lots of people that are doing that kind of stuff. And Chris Walter is a really nice example of that. Okay, yeah. The structural model, I, well, I think it's more of the econometric, I think it's closer to the econometric definition. I'm going to give you a definition of identification later that will be, and I'm going to think about, I'm going to give you a definition, I'm going to use it to think about structural model, identification within structural models, and it's going to be the econometric definition. So I, th so I don't know, I don't know if I want to speak for all structural, uh, structural economists, but I think most structural economists that think formally about identification are using the more formal definition. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to clarify and ask a question. So if notification is the last line, okay. what do you mean exactly by might come from somewhere else? Okay, yeah, so I hadn't gotten there yet. Okay. Um, but Yeah, so the structural stuff, again, I mean, th this is kind of the theme of the whole thing. You're thinking about external validity. You're formalizing the assumptions for, for external validity. Design-based stuff often requires fewer assumptions, okay? I want to say that. There's something about, there's something about some design-based stuff that kind of gets on my nerves. And they say, we don't like structural, we don't, we don't like structural model. We don't like structural models because they're making all of these assumptions. We're much more, we're, we're making much fewer assumptions. Here's our estimate. Okay, now I'm going to do a back-of-the-envelope back calculation in order to predict the effect of some policy. 
That back of the envelope policy, that's a structural thing that's fundamentally making structural assumptions. The difference between that and this is that they're not writing down the assumptions that they're making. It's, all, it's implicit rather than explicit. So I will say one thing that I do feel strongly about is if you're going to use the parameters of your model to, to do some counterfactual, it's better to write down the assumptions that justify that than to not write down the assumptions that justify that. I, that, that seems like an uncontroversial statement. But often just because you're not writing down the assumptions, often just because you're not writing down the assumptions doesn't mean that you're not making the, you're not making, you're not making the assumptions. Um, often people that are doing um, often people that are doing design-based stuff are, they're informally making these assumptions and they're not writing it down. I've talked about Josh Angrist a lot. It's sort of the extreme version of the design-based stuff. And he's not going to, at least from what I've seen him, mean, he's not going to do that. He's very clear that this is internal, this is, the parameter I'm estimating is for this population at this point in time and this is what I have. Whether it says anything about anything else, I don't know. That's what, that's, that's what I'm estimating. So he's very clear that here's the assumptions that I'm making, and he's not trying to extrapolate other places. When you try to extrapolate other places, you're making structural assumptions, and then you're better off writing them down. So that's another trade-off. Um, so what do I mean by the last one? To me, one thing that one, th this isn't, in some ways it's not structural versus non-structural. At some level, it's writing down the data generating process. So typically when we write down a structural model, we're, we're writing down the full data generating process. So we need to think about exactly how the data came about, okay? That's often a useful thing. In fact, often people, by writing that down, you can see stuff that you would, might not have thought of if you didn't. So people that have, think they have good intuitions for things, once you write down things formally, you realize that your intuition wasn't, wasn't actually right, right? I mean, that, we, we've seen that with economic models. Um, often things that you think are true, when you actually write it down and try to show it, 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 it turns out not to be true. Um, so to me, that's one advantage of this structural model. So, so what I mean by somewhere else is I'm going to write is the advantage. So the advantage is I've written down a model. I said here's where the data come from. I know how to interpret it. The disadvantage is I might be misinterpreting it. It might not. It might you know it might have come from somewhere else. So by thinking of it that way, I might be biasing myself to think about them. I might. You know, bias, I'm biasing myself to think about it in a particular way when that's actually not the right way to think about it. If I was more open-minded about it, I might, that might actually be better. So that, that's what I mean by that. Yeah? A lot of things that we're discussing here involve um, either estimation of parameters or trying to understand how parameters are working inside of a, of a model, implicit or explicit. So what sort of a role would possibly a non-parametric estimation play in using these things, at least possibly maybe in I'm going to get to non-parametric. I mean, we're going to get to non-parametric stuff a little bit a little bit later on. Um, what I'm thinking about is structure. So I, my structure here is almost non-parametric structural, right? Which might be, which in practice doesn't really exist. Um, so there's, I mean, there's another practical problem that we don't have an infinite data set, and we need to make we need to make we need to make assumptions in finite data. Those assumptions have implications, and there we need to make. I mean, we're trying to do, our, you know, we're trying to do more here than we are here. If we're trying to do more, we typically have to make stronger assumptions. Um, so yeah, I, I, don't, I mean, I don't know if that's sort of fundamentally structural versus design-based, but it's true that kind of parametric assumptions are going to play a bigger role here than they are here. Okay. Any other questions about? So this was good. Lots of questions on this slide. Um, if you have that, if you have any questions, there, every slide where well, I'm not going to finish. Um, okay. So to me. Where structural stuff is the most interesting is because I can use the structural model to estimate the effect of a policy that's never been implemented. So to me, if you are not a structural person, but you are a design-based person, here's why you should think of structural models as interesting. Structural models will allow you to answer questions that you can't answer without the structural model. Okay, so if you're a design-based person, that's what I think. If you're a structural person and you want design-based people to read your paper, that's why they're going to read your paper. 
So if, you, if you're a structural person doing structural work and you want to you wanna, you wanna convince design-based people and really almost anybody to read your paper, it's typically, almost always, going to be because you have some sort of interesting policy counterfactual that you can say something about. Okay? We all fall in love with our structural, I mean, it's speaking for myself um, and, and many students that I've known and colleagues. We fall in love with our structural models. We get super excited about them. We love how we estimate them. We love all the parameters that we get and everything that's going on in the structural model. Usually nobody else really cares that much about it. Okay? Most people don't care about our structural model fundamentally for our structural model. They care about our structural model because we can use the structural model in order to answer some question that we couldn't answer without it. Okay, so if you are a structural person wants to sell, you know, when you're going on the market, this is related to the question before, being a structural person going on the market, the easiest way to sell yourself is by having something to say, having some interesting policy finding that you have that you couldn't get without the, without the structural model. If you don't have that, if you're just saying, well, I'm estimating the super complicated model, um, what do I learn from the super complicated model? Well, I learn all kinds of stuff, right? That's not going to be, that's not, that's not how you want to have an interview. You want, to say, you want to say, here's my question. I estimated the structural model. The model allows me to answer the question, and here's the answer. Okay? So, for the, so here is, I, I don't want to say all structural work should look like this. Um, but I think most structural work should look like this. You should, I, I don't know if you should do this or act as if you did this. Um, but, but the paper should be about the policy counterfactual, not about the structural model fundamentally itself. A lot of structural papers write down the structural model, and they have the policy counterfactuals in the end, and the policy counterfactuals feel like an afterthought. And often they were an afterthought, right? I, you know, I've spent five years estimating my model. Um, five sounds like, for me, five sounds like an exaggeration. It is. I've never written a paper that short. In that, in that short amount of time. Um, so, so that was kind of supposed to be a joke, but <laughs> um, it's actually not true. I have written, I mean, I did get a job and I didn't stay in graduate school forever. So, so to me, the best way to do this, the best way to convince people to like your paper is focus on the policy question. So you start with a question, you write down the model that can, you write down a model that can simulate the policy. And this, this, this relates real to what we were talking about before. What belongs in the model or doesn't belong in the model depends on the purposes of a model. A model, that's, that's, what, we, that's what a model is. Like fundamentally when we learn about models, models are, are, are used to filter out all of the noise and focus on the essential things to answer a particular question. Okay? That should be true here as well. The model that we use is designed to answer a particular question. Okay? So the model should, the model should be designed to, to answer the question. To me, it's useful to think about identification in the data with the question being, if I think about the policy counterfactual, what are the key, what are the, what are the key parameters in estimating the policy counterfactual, and how are those parameters identified? Okay, so another thing, I was saying often we have tons of parameters, we have tons and tons and tons of parameters in our structural model. Usually only two or three or four of them are super important for actually estimating the key result. Right? It's like, you know, you have level effects and all kinds of stuff like this and all kinds of heterogeneity, but what really matters is the elasticity of labor supply. Right? And the elasticity of labor demand, if I want to look at the, you know, generally the equilibrium effect of, of, a, of, of a minimum wage on, on unemployment. Right? Labor, labor, labor supply, labor demand, that's fundamentally what I really care about. I have all these other parameters, but those two are going to be the super important parameters. I, might, I would think much more closely about how those parameters are identified than how the other parameters in your model are identified. So some parameters are much more important than others. And to me, it's useful to think about how those parameters are identified. And here, here by identification, I kind of mean the design-based thing. I mean, the map, the map between the data and those parameters is relatively clear. Okay? And that's the sort of thing that if you're doing structural work and you talk to design-based people who ask you about identification, that's what you can talk about. Right? You can say, yeah, there's lots of parameters, but parameter number one, that's the clear parameter, and that thing was ident is primarily identified off this experiment. Right? So that's how I, that's how I, that's how I discipline the, the parameter. Okay, 
So I kind of start with the policy, think about the model. The point of the model is to estimate the policy, then think about identification, estimate the model, simulate the policy counterfactual. So the paper becomes about the policy counterfactual, not about the model. For most people doing structural work, this is, a, this is the best way to do structural work. It doesn't have to be, now, and this is a little bit too extreme. Typically, most, work, most research doesn't, I mean, research doesn't usually work like that. Research goes around in circles, right? Typically, the question that we end up answering in our paper is not the one that, I st is not the one that you started. So it's not, it's not quite this simple. You might loop around, right? But the last loop, um, the last loop might look something like this. Okay. There's other reasons why structural models. Um, so I don't want to, I, I, I lot, there's lots of good structural models that don't look like that. So, for example, we might be, well, a, an interesting example is even in the evaluation problem. Right? Even in the evaluation problem, we might be evaluating the effect of some policy on labor supply, evaluating some policy on health, evaluating some policy on fertility. There's positive effects some places, negative effects other places, and we want an overall welfare calculation. So we want to calculate what happens to utility. Does utility go up or does utility go down? That's going to require a structural model. So even in the evaluation problem, if you want to use the model to evaluate some data, use something in the data that you don't see directly, you could use the structural model for that. And sometimes it's basic, sometimes it's basic research. Sometimes we want to we want to understand the world better. So we want to we want to we want to use the data to help understand the model, or we want to use the model to help understand the data, right? So this is just understanding a phenomenon out there. Can we do it? And then this is, an, you know, the, the other obvious one is methodological. So you might have some, it's not really a new model, but you have some much better way of estimating the model than other people have. It's much more efficient. That's sort of more of an econometric, applied econometric contribution than it is an empirical contribution. But, you know, there's obviously, I mean, <laughs> obviously there's tons and tons of important papers like that. So one of the takeaways you've been getting is that we should think about Not in a not in a general way. I mean, I mean, it's often yeah. No, often macro guys will do this: is they'll take a parameter estimating in one context and they'll stick it into another context. In some ways, that's a good thing to do, right? In the sense that I'm saying there's lots and lots of different parameters that you need. Somebody else came up, ran an experiment, and estimated this really well. Why should you redo it? Why you can just take their parameters? So sometimes it's a really good thing to do. Other times, the contexts are different. The populations are different. And the parameter that's relevant here is not at all, is not at all relevant here. Right? So, I mean, sometimes you know, somebody's estimating a Marshallian elasticity and then a macro guy, well, or a labor guy, or a public finance guy, or a development person, or anybody else, will take the, will take the Marshallian elasticity and treat it like a Frisch elasticity, which it isn't, right? So often the context in which we grab the things is not the same, and then you kind of really worry about what you're doing. But there's other times that it's a, you know, there's other times it's a smart thing to do, right? I mean, if, you know, if I'm going to write down a model with utility function, and I want some sort of risk aversion. There's tons and tons of papers that have estimated the coefficient of risk aversion. I, I don't need to get re, re, you know, I don't need to reinvent the wheel by getting consumption of my data by redoing everything they did. Sometimes it's useful to use the parameter. So I, there's no rule, right? Sometimes it's a good thing to do, and sometimes it's not a good it thing to do. Like you built a catalog in your mind of context or types of parameters that you find acceptable when you hear someone in the university. And then maybe arrange with that parameter. Yeah. Yeah, and then in the, and again with the theme of the thing, it depends on what you're doing with your model. I mean, if that's not a crucial parameter in what you're doing, then that makes perfect sense, right? Why should you go and reestimate the whole model in order in order to get this? If it is a crucial parameter, then you got to worry more about it. So it's it's very much context context specific. Other questions?
Yeah. What if your results are resented to functional form and then they would lead to two different conclusions about the same policy? Do you, do you have an idea about which one is more appropriate? Um. I mean, at some level, we're at some level we're getting to the identification problem. So, if the policy that you're trying to estimate is non-parametrically identified, then it shouldn't matter what functional form you use, and you should try to you, you figure out why you're not fitting the data, and then choose the right functional form. If the policy counterfactual that you're estimating is fundamentally not non-parametrically identified. And the only way you can identify it is by making a functional form assumption, and it's very sensitive to the functional form assumption that you make, then you should be super worried. Um, so it's partly, you know, I'm going to push nonparametric identification, and that's kind of the point of why, to me, nonparametric identification is useful. If I, if I know the parameter is nonparametrically identified, then kind of, there's still an issue about the same, right? Just, you, your confidence intervals might be sufficiently large, you can't say anything. So there's a sample, there's a sample size issue. But to me, that's exactly why I think of nonparametric identification as a useful exercise. Okay, other questions? Um, it's kind of a new thing, but this was exactly what I was just talking. This was exactly what I was talking about. So why it might be, uh, le le let, me, let me go through a few slides and, and then we'll take the break. Um, th this is, what I want to do next is I want to talk about, I want to talk about identification. Um, and this is where you're going to get, on a lot of things, uh, almost everything that I've said, I mean, I, uh, some of the stuff that I'm saying I feel pretty confident about, other stuff is my opinion. Right, and, and you can take it and you can, you know, not everybody is going to agree with everything that I said. Identification is probably more true. I might be the, I might be an extreme in, in, in this case um, in the sense that a lot of people that when they're, they're doing structural model, um, a lot of people when, when, they're, when they're doing, did I say this in this next? A lot of people, when they're doing structural estimation, don't really think about identification. I'm kind of the opposite. Typically, when I want to when I want to think about estimating a structural model, the very first thing that I do is I think about nonparametric identification of the model. It's a little bit we're in you know the shadow of Jim Heckman, and this is partly I'm a Heckman student, and this is something that I definitely that I definitely picked up from him. Um, so the first question that I typically ask when I start a new project is, here's the question I want to answer: Is the data up to answering the question? And how do I answer that? I usually write down a model. I think about what in the model it would what parameters in the model or what part aspects of the model would, would answer the question, and I think about what date, whether the data is available to, the, whether the data is available to do that. And if my answer is no, the data can't possibly inform this, I usually give up and don't, and don't work on the project. So for me, um, for me, and, and I might be the only, for me, it's super useful. This is, this is how I do research. I might be the only person in the world that does research this way. I, I don't know if anybody else does it that way, but to, but to me it's super, it's super useful. Um, this is one of these cases where, so by non-parametric identification, I, well, here we're in, we're in the econometric world. We're in the econometric definition of identification, not the, the design-based um, design identification strategy definition of identification. Um, a lot of people think this is a waste of time. It's not particularly useful, and, and, and I disagree. I mean, one part of it is I've had people say, well, nobody cites any of this stuff. It's a, even super important papers are not, are not well cited. I, I actually think it's been incredibly influential literature. It's been incredibly influential literature in the following way. So if I think about the Heckman two-step, so this is, you know, this is what Heckman got the Nobel Prize for. It, it very, without exclusion restrictions, the Heckman two-step only works because you have normality assumptions. If you're completely non-parametric in the model and you don't have, if you're completely non-parametric and you don't have exclusion restrictions, the model's not identified. Okay? As a result, the Heckman two-step, so, and we can show this formally non-parametrically. I mean, Heckman might be the main guy that's done this, so he was sort of the instrumental guy in hurting, in hurting the thing that he was most famous for. But right now, I don't think that's a fair way to say it in the following way. Right now, if you do a Heckman two-step without an exclusion restriction, it's, it's just 
Like when I, was, when I was the editor of the Journal of Labor Economics, if I would get a paper that estimated some treatment effect, it estimated the treatment effect using a Heckman two-step, and it didn't have an exclusion restriction, that was a desk reject. Okay, there, I, I could send it to referees, but I knew that there was no possible way that a paper like that was getting past referees. Now, in order to do something like a Heckman two-step, you need an exclusion restriction. Right? So that's a sense in which I don't, think he killed, I don't think he killed his own thing. I think what he did is made it clear where it's going to be useful and where it's not and how you, and how you really want to use it. So in, the, in that sense, um, in that sense, and not in a direct sense, but in a very indirect sense, I think that the nonparametric identification literature has had a huge influence on how we actually do empirical work. Um, and this was the answer, this is, this is the answer that I gave before. If I'm trying to answer some question, and I know that it's non-parametrically identified, then I know the only reason that I'm answering the question is because of the functional, the answer depends on the functional forms that I get. And I know that if I use different functional forms, I would get different answers, okay? And to me, it's hard to defend that. It, it might still be, if we, th it's, it's not totally useless, you still might want to do that, and something beats nothing. So if, if the alternative is just give up on the problem, um, you generally don't want to give up the problem. But it's much more convincing if, if you can, even though you're not non-parametric, if you can convince people that, that it, what you're getting, the parameters you're getting, are really coming from the data, they're not coming from the functional form assumptions, right? That's at some level where this matters the most, is when you, if you can show your model is non-parametrically identified, you can try to argue that the parameters for your model are direct, or they're, they're Im implications of the data, not implications of the functional form. All that said, functional forms still matter. Uh, yeah. When you say um, show it, you, you want to see a formal proof in a paper usually, or do you require people to explain it very well? I, I mean, yeah, to me, it's less of a formal proof, but more, I think more, I mean, often I will write formal proofs of identification. Um, but I think more often it's, a, it's, a, it's an argument. Um, and sometimes it can even be a more informal argument. It's like you, you can just play around and you can just show if I move this moment in the data, here's what happens to my parameters. And then I can kind of see the relationship between the moments that I'm doing and the parameters that I'm getting. So sometimes it can be sort of ex post, play around with the data and see what aspects of the data are driving the parameters in your model. So in a sense, editors don't require to have that in the appendix, for instance? Or? Editors don't require that you have, yeah, no, editors, yeah. I'm an editor and I don't require it. And if I don't require it, nobody else is going to require it. So, but, but, Editors almost always require a section that discusses identification of your model, um, an identification section where you discuss this, right? Um, what exactly, it look, and then this is where it's blurry. Somewhere, sometimes it's in between this formal, you know, the formal kind of metric stuff and the more identification strategy. Um, design-based stuff. So exactly what that is in there. I mean, to me, ideally what you want to do is you just want to, you, you want to, you want to make the mapping between the data and the parameters clear to the reader. That, that's ideally what you want to do. It's, that said, it's super hard to do. If you have a super complicated structural model, it's often very, very hard. It's often very, very hard to do this. So any, any further thoughts on any of the stuff that I talked about in the first half? So, so now I want to think more formally, and this, as, I, as I warned you, this part's going to be a little bit less, it's going to be a little bit more boring, I think. Um, but, but that doesn't mean it's not important. Um, I, wa I want to think about identification. The first, thing to the first thing to remember about identification is identification is fundamentally about the population. So the main thing about identification and econometrics is we're separating out the estimation issue. We're, we're ignoring small sample issues. The question for identification is if I got to observe the whole population in the data, um, the, the population of the data, which is a little bit of a weird context. It's you get to observe the population proportions of the stuff that you get to observe. So you don't get to observe everything in the world. You get to observe what you would get to observe if your data set was infinite rather than finite. So if I got to observe the population version of the, of, of the, 
of my sample, what exactly could I identify? What exactly could I tell apart from, from, from other things? Um, I'm going to base, I think the first time that I taught this, I gave Matzkin's 2000, this was 2007, some handbook chapter, I forget exactly which, Handbook of Econometrics, a paper by Rosa Matzkin in 2007. She had a formal definition of identification. I think I gave it in the past, but I think it was, it was, a, it was a very formal, there's, a, there's an advantage of formalizing things, as I said before, um, but, but sometimes you lose, it, but it's also a difficult thing to look at. And sometimes I think it, it, made, it made a relatively simple concept seem relatively more complex. Um, before thinking, about the, the, before thinking about identifications, the identification question is from the data, what can I say about the parameters? Before I can think about that, I've got to think about where the data comes from. So the first thing that we need to do before thinking about identification is write down the data generating process. And I want to think about it in the following way. So X's are going to be, X and UI are going to be exogenous, and I'm going to mean exogenous in kind of the, the economic not, not the standard econometric frame way we talk about it, but the standard economic way. So that, that Xi and Ui are formed outside the model. So I want to think endogenous variables as things that are formed within the model, and Xi is things that are imposed, that are de determined outside the model. So Xi and Ui are determined outside the model. The main difference between Xi and Ui is Xi, as you might guess. Xi is going to, I get to observe Xi as econometrician. I, I don't get to observe Ui. All of the work, all of the economic model is going to be contained in this why not thing. So why not is going to take some parameters, theta. Um, it's going to take some observables, x, because it's going to take some unobservables, u, and it's going to, going to produce a bunch of outcomes. Okay? Now, I could think about epsilon as sort of one dimensional, but typically you might think about this as a very large dimensional object. So, so in the simultaneous equations model, epsilon is going to have prices and quantities. Um, in a large panel data that every, where everything interacts, epsilon might have, might have 30 or 40 or 50 different variables that you might think about as your outcome variables, like 10 different variables that you observe over, over, over time. Um, so this is going to, uh, this why not is, tend to, is going to tend to be a, is going to tend to be a complicated object. Um, the other thing about this why not is it, you, you could think about equilibrium models. If you have multiple equilibria, in some way the multiple equilibria has to get, has to, somehow you have to pick an equilibria, that's going to be part of why not. So you could think about why not is if you had a day, if you're programming this up yourself, you're sitting in front of the computer and you want to program what happens in the model, right? You want to generate data yourself from your model. Why not is your computer program? It takes in the X's of the people, the UI's of the people, the parameters of the model, and, and determines the, the outcomes of the model. And it might be, this might involve solving for equilibrium when you do that. Okay? So that's a model. We know the model up to theta. Um, so what's it between non-parametric and parametric? All, typically, I want to think about non-parametric as just infinitely dimensional parameters. So if, if theta is a parameter like, X, like a beta from X prime beta, that's going to be parametric identification. Um, but I might, also think about, I might also think about theta as the distribution of the error terms. And I want to be non-parametric about the distribution of the error terms. And then it's going to be non-parametric. Or semi-parametric if some of your param parameters are finite dimensional and some are infinitely dimensional. Um, so, it, for example, if you think about a regression or model or something like that, you can think about this as the slope coefficients, the x beta coefficients, but in a regression model where typically we don't make any assumptions about the distribution of the error term, so we can be completely non-parametric on, on that distribution. So theta, <coughs> I'm going to kind of write it as if it's a parameter, which I think is a nice way to write it, um, but, but I'm also going to call it non-parametric identification because I can think about some of the, some of the elements of theta as being infinite dimensional. Okay, which is a way, which is another way to think about it as non-parametric. Is, is that clear? Um, so to, res to relate this to our original examples in the, in the um, simultaneous equations model, our outcomes, the things that are determined within the model, 
Um, so this is endogenous in sort of the classic sense of the word endogenous. Our prices and quantities, the X's and the Z's are the stuff that's determined outside the model. The UT and the VT are determined outside the model. The common attrition gets to observe this and gets to observe this. They don't get to observe this. The thetas and the simultaneous equations model will be the gamma and the beta. So these were the slope equations and supply and demand. I've I don't remember which is which. The coefficient on prices and the demand equation, the coefficient on prices and the supply equation, and here we're going to be non-parametric. It's going to be the joint distribution between, between the two error terms. We're not going to assume those are independent. We are assuming that these guys are independent of these guys. The data generating process is going to look like that. Okay? So that so this is a case where I'm actually solving for equilibrium. It's pretty trivial because it's two equations of two unknowns and it's, everything's linear, so I can solve for it um, by hand. But this is going to be my data generated process. So, so that's an example of what it looks like for the, for the simultaneous equations model. The Roy model, I, this is going to be, if all I was doing was giving you an example, this would be giving you much more information than you actually need. Um, but I want to think about nonparametric identification of the Roy model later on. Um, so we're going to use the same model. So I'm just going to, I'm going to do it now. Um, so in order to think about, before I can think about identification of the Roy model, I got to write down what I mean by the Roy model. I can't be completely more general. I need, a, I need a little bit more structure on the model. Um, so what am I going to, so I'm going to write down the full data generating process without, whoops, sorry, the, the point, the pointer button is right next to the right left button. Um, so, so I can define units of fish and hunt. I can u define units of fish and rabbits however I want. I don't have any natural units, so let me just choose a dollar as the natural unit, and then I can just normalize the price of fish and, and the price of rabbits to, to be equal to one. Um, I can think about wages. I can think about wages, as, and then I'll do my sort of the standard way that we write these models is we'll assume separability, um, and I will assume that wages depend on xf and x naught. Um, it's going to be additively separable, so this is the observable part, that's the unobservable part. Same with rabbits. And then for my utility function, I'm just, there's, there's, there's not going to be any sense in which utility for these two things differs. Um, the, the slope on these things is the same. So I just want to compare this thing with this thing, so I'm going to compare the difference of the wages, but then I care about this other stuff as well, right? So this is, this is picking up stuff that says I like to fish. <coughs> This is picking up stuff that I like to hunt. Um, and then I'm going to assume that the joint distribution of the error terms, so I've got four different error terms, are going to be independent of all of the observables. Um, but they could potentially be correlated with each other. So that's what I, this is what I will mean by this, at least, is a generalized Roy model that, that I'll think about. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know that the answer is, the answer is it depends on the particular context of the policy counterfactual that you're interested in. Um, I actually don't think it's, a, I mean, I can't, yes, yeah, there are going to be cases where I think it's a horrible assumption. I think in general it's a reasonable assumption. Just that all of the error terms are independent of all of the, of all of the X's and the Z's. For the choice model, it's actually, it's essentially innocuous. Well, it's, it's almost innocuous. In general, models that worry about heterosclerotic tests, usually you worry, I mean, my, usually papers that I see that worry about heteroscasticity, heteroscasticity doesn't matter very much. So my general view of the literature is typically this is, this is fine. Um, I'm sure that I can come up with examples where it would be horrible and you would, you would, you would screw up. But as a general rule, I think it's pretty reasonable. Yeah, I mean, there's, relaxing it is really hard. So there's a bunch of papers, there's a bunch of papers that relax these assumptions, but, but, but in a very simple way. That's, that's not really all that much better. As you allow for this one-dimensional object, right? So you have one-dimensional error term, um, and you can allow for non-separability. I, I, I almost don't want, I, we should talk about this afterwards rather than during it. I, this is better than, I, I don't like this, I don't think this is any worse than any other obvious alternatives. 
Um, it's still going to be hard. It's still a strong assumption. It's still going to be hard enough. Okay. Um, I, I, I could be more general with exclusion restrictions, or I could be less general. Um, but X, X not enters everywhere. XF is stuff that only enters here. XR is stuff that only enters here. Z is stuff that is only going to enter the choice decision. So XF affects my wage as a fisherman, but, but nothing else. XR affects my wage as a hunter, but nothing else. Um, Z is going to be stuff that affects my decision of whether to be a hunter or not, but doesn't affect wages. Okay. All of this is going to be super important going on. These are exclusion restrictions that we're going to use. I could be more general that I could have variables that enter here and here and not here, and you know, I could, but I don't want to do all that. So we'll, we'll just do it this way. Um, okay. People fish when UFI is bigger than, than URI. Um, let FI be a dummy variable. This is going to indicate whether people fish or not. So what do I typically get to observe? Your wage, your wage is going to be WFI if you fish, and W, oh, I tried to switch all these and I didn't. Shoot, this is a, I, problem is fishing and fish begin with F. Hunting begins with H, and rabbits begin with R. So I've gone back and forth, and sometimes I use H, and sometimes I used R. I tried to change all of the slides so there were no H's and there were only R's, and I screwed up here and here. Um, but in gen so that should be WRI. I got it right there, um, but I screwed it up there. So, that should, so, so th if I fish, I get that wage. If I hunt, if I hunt I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get that wage, so my wage is going to be this thing, since FI is a dummy variable. What do I get to observe as an econometrician? The two, things that are, the two things that are determined endogenously within the model are going to be the wage that I get and whether I fish or not. Um, my x's are going to be x, all, of the, all of the x's and the z. Um, the, u, the u's are actually going to be these u's plus, yeah, this is where I screwed up, plus those guys. Um, the thetas are going to be all of these functions. So the thetas will be this function, this function, this function, this function, and the g. So these are all going to be non-parametric at this point, so I'm going to allow them to be, I'm going to allow them to be completely general. OK. That's, those, those are examples. Here's the definition of identification. So first I want to think about point identification. And the idea of identification is a relative, relatively simple thing. The, the, the model, is, and it's almost more intuitive if I just say it. The model is identified, if I observe the population distribution of the data, the model is identified if there's only one version of the model that could have generated that population distribution of the data. So if I can take the population distribution of the data and I can invert it to get the model, the model is identified. If I can't do that, it's not identified. So to some extent, that's it. That's all, that there's, that's all that there really is to it. So it's identified if there's a unique value theta that could have generated the population distribution of the observable data. OK? Um, so you want a bit more formally, let theta be the parameter space of theta. It's calling it a parameter space, but it's non-parametric in the sense that theta can be multidimensional. Um, but this is the space in which theta lies. Let theta not be the true value of this thing. If there's some other theta 1 out there that's in the parameter space where theta 1 and theta naught are not the same, but it has exactly the same distribu joint distribution of these guys as does the model when it's generated by theta naught, then theta naught is not separately identified from theta 1, right? So if I look at my data and I say this data could have been generated by model theta naught or it could have been generated by model theta 1, I, I can't identify the difference between the two. If there is no such theta 1 for, what, for which that's true, then the model's identified. Okay, does that all make sense? It's kind of, it, it's like, the intuitive way of saying it, it, it it's thinking about it more formally, is to, and, and the, more, the more general way of doing it, is it gets, get, gets even more confusing. But when you prove identification formally, that's what you, you do. You prove that there's no other theta 1 that could have generated the data other than the true value. Okay. Um, Often now we've moved from point identification to set identification. So what is set identification? Here, rather than thinking about the think, insisting on a point, I want to think about theta i as the identified set. 
And this is something that really has taken off in econometrics, I'd say, in the last, in the last 10 to 15 years, where people are thinking a lot more about a set identification. So what is theta i? Theta i is the identified set. It's the set of possible models that could have generated the data. So there are multiple thetas that could have possibly generated the data. Theta i is going to be the set of possible values of theta that could have generated the data. Okay, that's the identified set. We have point identification when this thing is a, is a singleton. If there's only one value of theta that could have, if this identified set contains one object, then the model's point identified. If it, if it contains more than one object, it's not point identified. So that's more formal definition of what identified, what identified means, what identifying the model means. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, now, now I want to talk about this is a little level, this is something going beyond that, which, which I think is super important. Typically, what we're not really interested in when we estimate models is whether the whole model is identified. Almost never is the whole model identified. Often, what we care about is not the model. What we care about is a feature of the model, right? And the most important feature of the model that we care about, is that you know, the way that I motivated things is a policy counterfactual. So what I really care about is not whether the model is identified. What I really care about is whether the policy counterfactual is identified. Okay, so, so psi of theta is going to be a policy counterfactual. It's going to be, I'm going to assume that there's a unique psi. If I knew the, tr if I knew the true data generating process, I would know the policy counterfactual, right? Um, but, so, so the question is, is, if, is, there an, is, is, there a, is there a unique value of the policy counterfactual that's consistent with the generated data? And that's a somewhat more confusing concept. So if there's only one value of the policy counterfactual that's consistent with the data, then the policy counterfactual is identified. If there's more than one value, then, it, then it's not going to be identified. OK, does that make sense? Here's where the formal thing helps a little bit. You can think about psi i is the identified value. So I can identify what's identified is theta i. Those are the values of theta. Um, those are the values of theta for which the parameter. The, bleh, those are the parameter. Those are the parameters within the identified set. Okay. Let psi of theta be the policy counterfactuals that come from that. Then I can think about the identified set of the policy counterfactuals it is the set of policy counterfactuals that are consistent with the underlying data. Okay, you might get point identification of psi. You get point identification of psi i if psi i is a singleton. A really interesting case is going to happen, and this is not uncommon, when, the identified, when you don't have point identification of the whole model, but you have point identification of the policy counterfactual. So there's going to be cases where, si where this thing is a singleton, even though, even though this thing is not. OK, I'll give you some examples of that. So this all make clear. It, it's kind of make, and there's some sense in which we're taking simple ideas and making them abstract. Um, but, but in, going for, in going forward, formally, this is how we want to think about identification. Um, I already talked about this. I mean, psi of theta, generally, the most interesting case that I care about is it's going to be something like a policy counterfactual. Um, I, you know, I keep saying policy counterfactual. The, po the, part, the important part of the phrase policy counterfactual is counterfactual. It's not policy. I mean, it, sometimes it's, it's something about the data that we're trying to learn about, like what, you know, what's important and what's going on. It doesn't have to be an explicit policy that people might want to think about. You know, the policy counterfactual would be some, some decomposition that you, want to, that you want to do. So some sort of Ohaka decomposition is an example of a policy counterfactual. It's not, the policy part is not important, but the counterfactual part of it is. Um, OK. Ex the, classic the classic example of this would be just in the reduced form model where I don't have an instrument. In the reduced form model where I don't have an instrument, a feature of the model is the reduced form parameters. So, if, so I can write my structural model. I can reduce it down to this. Gamma star and beta star are the structural models. I can get consistent estimates of gamma star and beta star by running regression of p onto z and, and p onto z and x. So, the, so even though my fundamental structural model is not identified because I don't have an instrument, a feature of the model is identified. In particular, the reduced form parameters are identified. 
so what do we think about the policy counterfactual? The key thing about the, the key thing about identification of a policy counterfactual is the following. So this is the current, this, this is the way that the data is currently generated. This is the data generating model. Now we're gonna have this new policy in mind. Okay, when we have this new policy in mind, when we have this new policy in mind, we're gonna be generating the data in the counterfactual world. The data is gonna be generated in a different way. It's gonna be generated by H pi, F pi, and Y pi. Okay, so this is our model of what would happen, what would happen in the state of the world, in the state of the world, um, in the in the state of the world where we, we implemented this policy. Often policy counterfactuals that we think of are going to look something like this. We want to take the difference in mean as some outcome. So why could be wages, why could be income, why could be utility. So we just want to see whether people are better off in the current world than they would be in the in the in the in the counterfactual world, and so our policy counterfactuals often look something so look something like this, and you can see that this thing is a function of all of this stuff: the H, the F, and the the H, the F, and the Y. Um, okay, So, so, so I've been, I, I'm going to go. I'm going to go back in a second. So, so I want to make this distinction between direct identification of the policy counterfactual and identification of the full model. There are interesting cases where we can identify the policy counterfactual and we can't identify the full model. That's typically not the way that we estimate structural models. Typically, almost all of the time, we estimate the full model and then we use the full model to simulate to simulate the policy counterfactual. So I want to I want to focus on that case. Um, the other cases are super interesting, but they're very special. I want to focus. I want to focus on the on the general case. So what do I what do I need What do I need in order to identify the policy counterfactual if I'm doing this approach? It's really going to take two different types of assumptions. Okay, the first type of assumption is just that theta is identified. So if I want to, I want to know, I want to know the data generating process. I want to know what happens. I need to ask, I need to identify the data generating process. That's point number one. Um, but point number two, which is sort of more abstract and more important, is that not only that, we need to know what the policy. What we need to know what h pi, f pi, and y pi would be, given the given the current parameters. Okay. So in particular. If the, if the outcome under the policy regime involves some parameters that, we, that aren't part of the current data generating process, then we're screwed. Then there's nothing we can possibly do. So it's not only do we need to be able to identify, not only do we need to be identify the, do we need to identify the current model, we need to be able to tell how the current model relates to the policy counterfactual. So identification, your structural model needs to be rich enough that you can think about the policy counterfactual within your structural model. If the policy counterfactual involves something that's not part of your structural model, then your structural model is not going to be useful for that. So that's a sense in which we need two different things when we think about identification of the policy counterfactual non-parametrically in this structural context. We need to be able to identify the data generating process for the current data, and we also need to know the map between that data generating process and what the data generating process would be had the policy been enacted. Does that make sense? In some sense, that's my definition of structure, right? In some sense, what I'm saying, what it means for theta to be policy invariant means that the thetas, the thetas, the thetas here are exactly the same as the thetas here. If they're different, I'm in trouble. Now, of course, you could have some that matter there that don't matter there, then you're fine. But if you have stuff that's here that's not there, you're screwed. You can't, they, they, they don't, you have parameters that aren't relevant in the current state of the world, um, but matter in your policy, in your policy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So is that a testable thing, or is that just kind of a, you just have to believe that your parameters won't change under a policy? Like, is there any way to, like, to go on about it rather than just believe? Um, I mean, yeah, okay, so two, so two different things. One, one is it's testable within your model. So you write down a model, and then the question is, can you, can you simulate the effect of the counterfactual in your model? Um, 
And sometimes the answer to that thing is, no, you can't do it. So like if you think, of, think about it, sort of a classic I.O. example where I want to introduce a new good, but the new good has a new error term that has a new distribution that I, that I don't get to see, that I can write down that model, but I know that I can't simulate the counterfactual within that model because the, because the distribution of the error term for the new good it doesn't enter, it doesn't affect the current data set. So there's cases where I can look at my model and say, yeah, no, this model is not rich enough in order to simulate the pol that policy counterfactual. The question whether it's testable or not gets a little bit to what we were talking about before. You could do, th you could do things like do, you could estimate your structural model and then do an experiment to see to, to see whether you, um, whether, you, whether you fit the policy counterfactual or not. I don't, that's not, I don't know if it's, 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 t it's not really, it's almost all tests. It's, when you do tests of structural models, you're not testing a part of the structural model, you're testing the whole structural model, right? So what you, you know whether, if you pass, you pass the whole thing or you fail to reject the whole thing. If you reject, you don't know whether it's the, you don't know whether the, the problem is theta is not policy relevant or whether you just wrote down the wrong model. Right? So it's, te it's testable in, it's testable in the sense that structural models are always testable and they have, they have implications. I can look at them in the data and they're potentially, I can potentially reject it, but I don't know what part of it it is that's rejected. There I could only do it uh, to be clear on that one, I could only do it if I actually had the policy, right? So if you're saying what would happen in, in an alternative regime and that regime never happened, then it's going to be fundamentally non-testable. If, if, if you could have a policy where you did an experiment, where you implemented the policy, then you could test it. Yeah? So if, we, if, we're, if we're thinking about a policy that would actually change I, I mean, I would not say it that way. I would say if the, if the model that you've written down now is not rich enough, you need a model. Your model needs to be rich enough in order to do this. If the current model that you wrote down is not rich enough to do this, you need a new model. Right, you need a richer model, or you need to give up, or or give up one or the other, right? So I wouldn't say it's not this because your new model, I will just it'll be the new version of this. Yeah. In this context, if you learn that like fish have mercury or something, you know, you fish anymore, is that is there a parameter that you already baked into this example that would need to be function maybe where that weight, or will we say that's outside the model, and so that would be a problem, kind of like with smoking? Say it again, so. I was trying to give an example in this model, right? Where? To make a parallel with what you started out talking about, which was smoking. Yeah. You, you could tax people, but they also, information about the harm of smoking could simultaneously drive the tax and drive behavioral changes in the kind of tax. Here, I was trying to say, like, there should be more mercury or something. Right. And people don't want to eat it. So. Well, a, good, a good example that might screw this up is if there, you have social norms or something like that. Right, so think about the stuff that Larry was talking about. So um, if there's very few fishermen and none of the cool kids in the class are fishermen, you don't really want to be a, you don't really want to be a fisherman. But if we start, if we start subsidizing fishing, so now that the, so now the cool guys move into fishing, um, then you might get other people to form into fishing. So that's a case where we would be, we would be rejecting, I mean, it's not, it's not that it's not, pol the policy didn't, it, that's really not, that's not so much a case where you misclassify, that's really a case where you misclassify preferences, not a case in, right, in which preferences themselves are fundamentally policy invariant. Right. Um, another case would be if there's equilibrium effects. Right, so if I impose this tax that leads to more fishermen, we start, o we, because we have more fishermen, we have too many fish in the market. The price of fish goes down, and as soon as as soon as that happens, um, as soon as that, what becomes policy? What in that model? What breaks down there? Suppose I've general. Suppose that I've general. Suppose that I've general equilibrium effects, um, and the general equilibrium effects are such that when I do this tax, more people fish, the price of fish falls, wages of price of fish falls. What's the, what's what? Where do I screw up the policy invariance there? 
what? This thing, this thing. Yeah, exactly. It, it's really the sutva assumption, right? So, so now the, I've taken the wage of a fisherman for person I as given. Now the wage of a fisherman becomes, depends on the policy because it, it gets affected by the, by the equilibrium effects. Yeah. So equilibrium effects where the prices of the fish matter is a case where um, these, these objects here would not be policy invariant. Okay, now you could write down, you could include, you could, you could, this is a case where you could take the model, you could make the model richer, you could think about equilibrium effects and then, and then you could fix that problem. Okay. Um, let me skip some stuff. What was I talking about? Um, yeah, so, so, the, so like I said, there, there are certain example, there are certain examples in which you, can, you, don't need, you, can you don't need to estimate the full structural model in order to estimate the, in order to estimate the policy counterfactual. My favorite example that people don't like to think about um, is even within the classic reduced, even in the classic simultaneous equations and models, there's policies that you can think, that there's policies that you can impl that you can simulate even from the reduced form model, okay? So in the reduced form model, um, even in the reduced form model, I can identify the reduced form. I can identify my gamma star, my beta star, my V star. I can't identify the full structural models if I, if I don't have an instrument. But suppose that, the, suppose that the policy that I have in mind means subsidizing education. So X, X is going to be, which is kind of goofy here because it's supply and demand, so I don't know exactly what that means. But so the, so the where I'm going to subsidize education, so my population is going to become more educated, okay? Education here is an X, right? So now what I want to, my policy simulation involves changing X. If my policy, if my policy simul simulation involves changing X, this is the new price that I'll get in the model, this, and I can get it directly from the reduced form, right? The re in, the, in the simultaneous equations model, the reduced form model gives you the causal effect of X on Y. It doesn't give you the causal effect of prices on quantities, but it gives you the causal it gives you the causal effects of the x's on prices and the x's on quantities. So if your policy experiment involves changing the x's, you don't need to know the full structural model to in, in order to estimate that policy counterfactual. So even in the classic case that we think about, even the classic simultaneous equations model, you can still use reduced forms in order to do policy simulations. Okay? Is that you get that point? And 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 this is also this is also why um, I don't like using this is where reduced form has context. I can only say that I can only say that because I could write down the structural model. From the structural model, I could I could simulate from the model I could simulate what the policy counterfactual could could be, and I can sh and I can show you that the reduced form is allows me to identify that policy counterfactual. If I didn't write down the structural model, I couldn't do that. Okay, so this is a case where the phrase reduced form doesn't mean just any old regression. The phrase reduced form means start with a structural model and derive the reduced form as a, as a function of the underlying structural parameters. Okay, let, let me, um, we don't have, what do we, we have 55 minutes. I want, I'm going to skip this stuff. Let me, I want to think about identification of the, Roy, of the generalized Roy model because this is, this is important. This is important not only for thinking about structural estimation, but it's important for generally thinking about the treatment effect model. Okay, so in some level, what I'm thinking about is how we would identify, non-parametrically identify treatment effects. Um, the key reference, the key reference for the generalized Roy model for the Roy model itself is this Heckman, Heckman on Array paper in 1990. There's a ton of other Heckman papers that think about the generalized Roy model. I'm going to follow a discussion in Handbook of Labor Economics that I had with, with Eric French wh where we think about this. And I, let me reemphasize what I said before. It's kind of the simplest model that one would ever write down. It's just a simple choice, binary choice, either A or B. But it's going to turn out that nonparametric identification of this model is super hard. 
Okay, it's going to require really super, super strong, um, super strong assumptions. I'm using I use I'm using generalized Roy model in a way a little bit different um, than Heckman uses generalized Roy model. Um, and the difference is in a lot of the Heckman papers, he's not worried about he's not worried about this part of the utility. So he doesn't have the he doesn't have the utility as a it is an explicit function of the outcomes. So I want to make it I'm somewhere in between the Roy model and and the more generalized uh, Heckman model by by writing the model we're writing the model in this way. Okay. Um, so I want to think about identification of the, I want to think about identification of this model. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it in four steps. Um, as a reminder, here here is the model. Um, everything is going to be additively separable. Everything is going to be independent of the x's. We've talked about whether how strong an assumption that is. I'm completely non-parametric. My g's and my size are completely non-parametric. So I want to think about non-parametric identification of this model. Okay, makes sense. Are we on the same page? Um, and you can sleep, uh, like I said, this is the boring part, so if you're sleeping through this part, um, that's fine. It, it'll be more interesting later on, so I'll wake you up in that point. Um, so so here, here, are, here are the assumptions that, I, that I'm going to need, um, and they're going to be, they're going to be strong. Um, the first assumption we talked about already, um, we're going to assume that all of the error terms are, are uncorrelated with, with all of the x's. Okay. Now, without loss of generality, I can normalize. Um, I can normalize the location of these error terms. And the reason I can normalize location of these error terms is I have this separable thing here. So I can always add six to that and subtract it from that, and I haven't changed the model in any in any real way. So the way that I'm going to normalize it is I'm just going to normalize the mean of that error term to be equal to zero. Um, I'm going to normalize the mean of that error term to be zero. And if you're an econometrician, you would get mad at me because what I said is not explicit. It's not really true. In order to normalize the mean, I have to, the mean of the error term, I have to assume that the mean of the error term is actually not, it actually exists. Um, and I haven't actually explicitly assumed that it exists, but it doesn't really matter. So, so don't give me a hard time about it. Um, the other thing, I, I, to normalize these guys, I'm going to do it in a goofy way. I'm going to, and you'll see why later. I'm going to normalize the median of this combination of the error terms to zero. Okay. The first thing you'll notice, which is sort of obvious, is all that matters is relative utility, not the absolute level of utility. So that all, all that's going to matter is my relative preference for fishing versus hunting. So all that's going to matter in the model is VF minus VR. The level of them I'm not going to be able to identify anyway. So that, that'll go away pretty soon anyway. So that's why I have that thing. So I'm essentially normalizing the difference of that, the location of the difference. That location has been normalized. That location has been normalized. I'm, lo I'm normalizing that one in this way. That's going to turn out to be a really convenient way to do things, do things later on. OK, here's the, here's the really strong assumptions. And, and we'll talk a lot about these things. I'm going to make the following three assumptions, which, which, um, which look kind of complicated, um, but may, they're maybe not that complicated. This thing here, this thing here is the index that determines whether I want to be a fisherman or a hunter. Okay, so this is the this is the wage as a fisherman plus the, the the observable part of the wage as a fisherman plus the utility as a fisherman minus the wage as a hunter minus utility as a hunter. So this object is the index that's going to determine whether I want to be a fisherman or not. Okay, what I'm going to assume is I can fix the variables that influence whether I fish or not, which is x naught and f. I'm going to fix x naught and f, and then I'm going to say that the support of this whole thing is the, is the whole real line. Okay, what is, that, what is that saying? We'll get back to this, and it's a strong assumption, and we need it, and we'll talk about why we need it. What it's saying is I, I need an exclusion restriction. So I need an instrument. So I need something that affects whether I be whether I'm a fisherman or not, um, but does not affect my wage as a fisherman. Okay. So that's like a standard instrument. It sounds like an instrument, but it's actually much. It's a much stronger assumption than an instrument. An instrument just requires that you have some variation. I'm saying not only do you have some variation, you have the whole real line. I can move this all the way from minus infinity to positive infinity. 
Okay? I'm saying that here, and I'm also, the, the, the second one is kind of the same one as the first one. The, the first one is saying that I have an exclusion restriction for hunt. This is, the, this is the exclusion restriction for fishing. This is the exclusion restriction for hunting. If you're just using Z, it's really only, it's only one. If all of the variation was coming from Z, it would just be one assumption. It wouldn't be two separate assumptions. Um, but it's a little bit more general because it can come from the X's the XF and the X, XR as well. Okay, so I'm assuming that I have an exclusion restriction. That's something that affects whether I fish or not, but not whether I fish, and I can, view, and I can, and I can move that over the whole real line. That's exclusion restriction number one. Exclusion restriction number two is the other way around. Now what I'm going to assuming is that conditioning on the stuff that affects my taste for fishing, I can move the wages, the wage index, across the whole real line. So I need two different types of exclusion restrictions. I need something that affects, so this is fishing and this is the wages of fishermen. I need something that affects this that doesn't affect this, but I, and that's the first two assumptions. The second one is I need something that affects this that doesn't affect that, and that's gonna, that's gonna be the second assumption, okay? Those are strong assumptions. You can bug me about them, but, but we'll, we'll talk about the fact that not all, that the, the what you need to identify the selection model is much stronger than just an instrument. Um, and, and I think often people that think about, um, think about identification in this model want to use the intuition for identification in the IV model, and they're similar, but they're not the same. Okay. Another way to see, to be related to heterogeneous treatment effects that Jeff was talking about. If you want to identify all of the heterogeneous treatment effects, that's much more difficult than identifying just simply the local average treatment effect. You need a lot more variation in your exclusion restrictions, and we'll talk about why. Okay, step one, I'm going to call identification of the reduced form choice model. And here I'm using reduced form choice model in a way that I'm complete, in, in, the, in the, really the classic definition of, of reduced form. Point number one, all that matters is relative utility. Okay, so that if I give you 10 more, if I give you 10 more utils as a fisherman and 10 more utils as a hunter, you're, that's not going to affect whether you hunt or you fish. So all that's identified is, is relative. So let me define this psi thing to be the difference, and let me define the new i to be the difference in, to be the difference in the news. Okay, that's point number one. Um, Point number two is, is at this point, I want to write the reduced form in an even, in, in an even further way that I, let me let psi star combine the psi, the gf, and the g sub r. It's an r, not an h. Um, so, in that, so, I'm, in that, so that's a reduced form in the classic definition of reduced form. That is, if I know this object if I know this object, this object, and the two psi's, I can calculate the psi star. So the psi star is a known function of the underlying structural model, but generally I can't invert it the other way, okay? I may or may not be able to. So, so, that, so that's V star. Um, the, differences, the differences in utility is going to be this object minus, I, I made it a minus object because it's gonna, it's gonna be nice in the next slide. Now, obviously it doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative. Um, so, what do, so what is the probability of fishing? The probability of fishing, given my x's, is the probability that my u of fishing is bigger than my u of hunting conditional on the x's, which is just the probability, the, the probability that this thing is bigger than zero is just the probability that this object is bigger than that. Okay? Does that make sense? What is the probability that this object is bigger than that? That is just the CDF of this object evaluated at that point. So the, so the probability, um, so the probability of being a fisherman, um, I can write in the following way. Okay. So we okay? Are we, are we okay so far? There's two interesting things about this. Okay. Interesting thing number one is is psi star identified? Without looking at this part or on that part on the other side of the room. Is psi star, I'm screwed if I want to identify psi star, okay? Unless I know the, distri unless I know the distribution of the error term, right? The, 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 I, I could choose psi star to be anything I want. And I could take any monotonic transformation of psi star and, ch and change g, g of v star appropriately, and I haven't changed anything about the probability 
So psi star is only identified up to a monotonic transformation. Okay? That's point number one. What does that mean about a logit model? Is a logit model, is assuming my error term is logit a, 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 a parametric assumption? Does it have to be a parametric assumption? No. No. Without loss of generality, I can choose this thing to be, I can choose this thing to be logit, and then I can choose this thing to be the inverse of the logit. It's going to give me exactly the same probability. So if the if so when you write a model as x beta plus epsilon, where epsilon is logit, and that's your logit model, that is a parametric model. But if you had if you were non-parametric in the x part, but you s assume that the distribution of the error term was logit, you actually have not made any assumption at all. Okay? It's not that important in what we're doing, but it's sort of an interesting, it's an interesting fact to know. So, so we're hopelessly under-identified here. However, um, one thing that I can do is I can identify level sets of this object. And that's what's going to be important in the next step. Okay? In particular, I know that if I have two values of x, I have two, I'm, I'm assuming the distribution is continuous. I have two values of x, xa and xb. I know if I have two values of xa and xb, they, and they have exactly the same probabilities of being a fisherman, then it's got to be the case that this thing is equal to this thing. Right? If this one, if this one were bigger than this one, this probability would be bigger. If this one were bigger than that one, this probability would be bigger. So if they're equal to each other, then these things have to be equal to each other. Does that make sense? Okay. This is going to be this is going to be the crucial thing that we are about to use in the next step. Identification of the wage equation. So th th this is kind of what my advisor won the Nobel Prize for. Some version some version of of dealing with this problem. So now we want to think about identification. Th this is the classic selection problem. We only get to observe the fisher we only get to observe the wages of fishermen for those people who actually fished. Okay, so we want to calculate what that thing is. What is it? Well, the, well, if I just ran a regression, so I just look at the expected wages, conditional on x's and conditional on being a fisherman, what's that going to be? It's going to be this GF thing plus this object. Okay, what, is, what, is, what do we call this object usually? This is the selection bias. Okay, Typic typically, People are self-selecting into fishermen. Typically, since people are self-selecting into fishermen, when I condition on being a fisherman, your expected error term is not going to be zero. It's going to be something different from zero. So this is the classic selection problem, and this is the, cla this is the classic issue that we want to deal with. OK, so we want to deal with this problem. How do we deal with this problem? There's going to be two different solutions. Um, that are going that are going to be that are kind of that are going to be kind of similar, um, but they're going to require a little bit different assumptions. Okay, the first thing that I want to think about is I want to identify GF, but only up to location. Okay, that is, I don't want to observe the level of GF. All I want to observe is the difference in G, how G, how GF varies with x. That's going to be turn, going to be much easier than getting the intercept. Okay, so if you thought about this as a regression model with slope and intercept, the, inter the slopes are much easier to get than the intercept. So let me talk about how you identify the slopes or the, or the difference in this thing. Um, so in particular, what do I want to do? For any XFA um, and XFB, I want to identify the difference in these two objects. How am I going to identify the difference in these, in these two objects? Well, I can do the following thing. Let, let XH, now, so I want to fix FF, I've got four degrees of freedom. I have my XF, my X0, my XR, and my, um, and my Z, okay? Essentially, what I want to do is, it, let's like not focus so much on the XR or the XH, partly because I screwed up the notation, but the Z is normally what we think of as the exclusion restriction. So here's where we're going to use the exclusion restriction. I want to fix this thing, but I want to use the fact that I have variation in Z. So what am I going to do? I can even fix the ZB to be anything that I want. Because I have this full support condition, I can fix this object, and I can, and I can, fix, and I can fix this object. In particular, I'm going to choose those objects 
the, the x naught a and the x and the x naught b and the x f a and the x f b, th those things are going to be exactly the same. But now I can move my value of z around um, so that these probabilities are exactly equal to each other. Okay? Yeah. Say, say it a little louder. I don't need to. It does, no, I'm not. So, I, yeah, I don't need, I, I've got, I only need one degree of freedom, and I have four variables. Yeah. So, essentially, what I, so I'm going to fix the, I'm going to fix x not a, x h a, x not b, x h b. I'll fix, I can fix these guys as well. If I, I can without loss, I can, and that's fine. Now I've got two things that I want to move around. I'm going to move these two things around so that the probabilities are exactly equal to each other. Okay, does that make sense? So I can identify in the data. Because I can observe the probability that f is equal to 1 conditional on x in the data, I can find level sets of that thing. Okay, what do I know about, what do I know about the model if the probabilities are the same? That means that this thing evaluated at xA is exactly the same as this thing evaluated at xB. Okay, does that make sense? So I've chosen these, these things and these things I determined ahead of time. That was, I want, that's because I want to identify that object. I can pick any values of those, so it doesn't matter what those are. Those are what I'm starting with. I'm going to pick a value, I'm going to set these guys. My support condition says I can find some value of these guys so that these two things are equal. Okay, that's point number one. Point number two is I can know, I know when that happens in the data from this equation here. Okay, so now what I've done is I've got, I've, these things are set ahead of time, those two things are equal. Are you guys, are you with me okay? This is the, the, the then the next, the next step is kind of where the magic. So this is using the full supports, right? This is using the full support. Yes, you may need to vary the flight of the XFA, so this is the Exactly. Yeah, yes. The exactly. Um, Exactly. I could relax the full support. If I didn't have full support, I, would, I could do some sort of partial identification, right? So if I didn't have full support, I could, do the, I could do this when I can do this, and I couldn't do this when I couldn't do this. So I wouldn't, so I need full support to get this. I need full support to get this everywhere. I don't need full support to get it some places. Yeah. Um, Okay, so here's kind of here's kind of where the magic is going to happen. Now I'm going to take the expected value of the wages evaluated at x a. I'm going to take the expected value of the wages evaluated at x b. You know, I, I thought I did a good job cleaning up the notation, and I realize now that I did a horrible. There should be z's in the top line, and I'm sorry about that. Anyway, so, so now I want to take the differences in the conditional wages, give it evaluated at xA and xB, where xA and xB were as defined on the previous slide. Okay? What is this going to be? It's going to be this object, which is what I started with. That's what I want to identify. Then I'm going to have the selection bias in the A equation, and I'm going to have the selection bias in I'm going to have the selection bias in the B equation. However, the fact that this object is the same as this object means that this selection bias is exactly the same as that selection bias, so it's going to cancel out and you're going to be able to identify the difference. So the exclusion restriction is going to allow me to make, by, by get, I can play around with the exclusion restriction to make sure the selection bias is the same in the two cases, and then I can difference it out. Okay, does that make sense? So there, then, the, then the model is identified. So it's pretty cool. It's how exclusion restrictions are working. It's kind of like an instrument, and people want to use it, but it's not the same as an instrument. We're, we're, doing, we're making a little bit of a different argument than, they, than we're making when we do, when we do IV. It should be, yeah, that, that's what I was, yeah, I'm, that's my, that was what I was saying before. There's a typo. I think I switched. There's all kinds of typos. There's all kinds of typos. I also noticed there's a B, I mean, this one is A minus B, this one is B minus A, and then this one is A minus B again. So there are typos all over the place, and I apologize. And this is part, uh, it's, it's, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, okay. But notice that this is only going to get us the difference between values. What, right, what, this argument is an argument about, get, it's, not a, it's not about getting rid of the selection bias. It's about finding two places where the selection bias is the same and it cancels.
okay? But it doesn't allow me to get the intercept. Um, and do I care about the intercept? Um, I'll go there. It actually, for most of the models, if you think about most of the policy counterfactuals that we want to identify, we need to know the intercept, right? So what this thing tells us about, this thing tells us about, this object tells us about what would happen if we changed the x's and held the occupation constant. But the interesting question that we're interested in is people switching occupations, right? Moving from the A to the B. And if people are moving, I'm sorry, moving from the fishing to the hunting, if people are moving from the fishing to the hunting, the first part of that difference is going to be the difference of the intercepts. So if we want to identify any kind of treatment effect at all, we're going to need to know something about, we're going to need to know something about the intercepts, okay? So the location here is important. Right? And, and the location is important. Notice everything is symmetric. I did this for fishing. I can do exactly the same thing for hunting. So I did it for fishing. I did it for hunting. But now I want to compare fishing and hunting. This isn't that helpful for that, right? Because all I know is stuff within fishing. I know stuff within hunting. I can, can't compare the two between. I can't compare between the two. So I, so I, need, to, I, need, to, I need to be able to identify the intercept. And here's where things get really ugly. Um, but it's not my fault. It's, it, and it, this is, it's, it's the fundamental facts of the selection model. So what I want to do now, I don't know good notation for this. Um, but, so this is notation I use. I want to fix xf not. I want to fix the, the variables that enter the wage equation. And, and I want to vary the stuff that enters the selection equation. And I want to vary it all the way so that this thing goes to positive infinity. Okay? It's called identification at infinity. So people, people kind of make fun of it, and maybe they should make fun of it. But what I'll also say is not only is it, does it work, but without this, you're screwed. Okay? Um, so anyway, so, so I want to think about holding this thing fixed and sending this thing to infinity. So what happens, what happens when I do that? Well, the expected value of the wage is the, this thing plus the selection bias. So this thing, because we're holding these guys fixed, that thing's fixed. So nothing happens as I move stuff to infinity. What happens to this object when I send this thing to when I send this thing to infinity? So what am I doing? I'm conditioning on some variable being less than a number. If the number that I'm conditioning on being less than is arbitrarily large, then conditioning on that thing is totally irrelevant. So it's like not conditioning at all. If I don't condition at all, then it's going to look like that. I normalize the expected value of this thing to be zero, and therefore I can identify this. Okay, so if I can send the selection equation, if I can send the selection equation to infinity, I can eliminate the selection bias and I can identify this thing. Okay, I got bad news and I got bad news. Yeah. This is like, this is cool, but when can we, um, when can we do that? What? When can we do that? We can do that when we have lots of variation in our instrument and. So what are, we do, what are we doing, really? I mean, at some level, what I'm, what I'm doing is saying, if I can find some, if I can move my instrument so much, let me say it a different way. If I can find a sample, if I can find a, a sample in the data for which there's no selection, that is, they're all, they all fish, then there's no selection bias. Right? So in that sense, it's sort of a trivial thing, and it kind of sounds like cheating. So what I'm saying is if I can find some sample in the data, where, I mean, if, Z, if, if the Z thing is arbitrarily large, we're saying we're finding some sample in the data. It's a random sample of fishermen because the Z doesn't affect, fish, doesn't affect your wage as fishermen at all. All of these guys fish. If all of these guys fish, there's no selection bias. Okay, so it's cheating in the sense that that's really what I'm saying. It's saying if I can find a subset of the data for which there's no selection, then there's no selection bias, and I get a consistent estimate by running things on that way. Okay, so you can see why you can see why it's useful, but you can also see why it's sort of troublesome and whether we actually believe it or not. Okay, but the other thing I want to say is if you don't have that, if you can't do this, then you can't identify the model. Okay, so it's not only do you need this, it's a, you, you, it's, this is the only way to identify things. And the way to see that is suppose you couldn't do this. That is, suppose that there was some upper bound of your phi star. Okay, there's some upper bound of your phi star, so you can only go so high. 
Now think about anybody who has a VA, VI star which is higher than this GU. Who are those people? Those are people that there's no possible state of the world in which they're going to be fishermen. Right? There's no possible way to manipulate this object that's going to get those guys to fish. If there's no possible state of the world in which those guys are going to be fishermen, there's no possible way that we can learn in the data about what their wages would be if they were fishermen. So the model's not identified. Okay, so it's, it's sort of a, it's, that, that's why it's sort of bad news and bad news. It seems like a cheap thing to do, but it's really unavoidable. Without, without, without doing this, um, with, without doing this, the model is fundamentally unidentified. In particular, this object, the value of the error term, the, the people, the value of the wages these guys would get as, as fishermen is fundamentally, not, is fundamentally not identified because there's no state of the world in which they ever fish. Okay? Um, so that's, that's the selection problem. It's much worse than the IV problem. It's a much harder problem. It's not only, I mean, for this non-parametric identification, it's not only that you need exclusion restriction. You need exclusion restriction that goes all the way to infinity. And if you don't have that, the, f the model's not going to be identified. At least the full model's not going to be identified. Yeah? Is there an analogy that's made with the idea of inducing people through assignment to a treatment? If you can't get people to comply to become a fisher, say, then you're just never able to learn about what their outcomes might have been like. Right. Right. No, it's, th this is, uh, yeah. This is very closely related to the local average treatment effect. Right. If, if the vet, in fact, it's if you have a if you have an instrument where you can move the propensity score and you can only move it between. Right. So here's your propensity score. This is the probability of getting the treatment. This is one. So this is your propensity score as a function of your x is going to be your instrument. This is one over here, and this is zero. But the range of your data is only is, your, the range of your data is here. You can estimate the local average treat. You can estimate any local average treatment effect you want within this range, okay? But there's no. But but you're never going to learn anything about this group of people, and you're never going to learn anything about this group of people. So this is. It's not only the never takers. It's the never ever takers, right? It's not. It's not only. It's not, only with, it's not only with this binary instrument do they not take it, but there's no, in, there's no value of the instrument which they would ever take it. If that's the case, you're never going to learn what would happen to them if they took the treatment. It's sort of obvious in a, it's sort of obvious in a sense. If you want to estimate something like the average treatment effect in the population of something like JTPA, you need some state, you need to know what would happen to me if I took JTPA. So you would need something in the data that would induce somebody like me to enroll in JTPA, and you're not going to find variation like that in the data, right? You're not going to find you're not going to find cases where anybody, really anybody with a PhD in economics, is ever going to enroll in something in something like JTPA. Okay, so this it's not only it's it's not only related to that. In some sense, it's exactly the same argument, right? So so what what can we do here? Um, this is really one of these cases where we're in, the, we're in the partial identification world, right? We can't identify the full model. We can identify, if, we, if we're in this world, we're, we're not fully identified. We are partially identified, and there is some stuff that we can say, but, not, but, but we can't say everything. At some level, and this is, I skipped these slides, at some level this is something we teach in 101 economics. If you're trying to forecast, and you're trying to forecast way out of the range of the data, you can't do a very good job of it, right? We can do a pretty good job forecasting within the range of the data, but we can't do a very good job forecasting with, outside the range of the data. This is kind of making the same argument. What are we trying to identify when we're trying to identify the expected value of that? This is the expected value, this is a counterfactual in which everybody in the world becomes a fisherman. If that's way outside the range of the data, it's generally not going to be non-parametrically identified. Okay, so it's it's very much it's related to other things that you, I mean it's not only related to other things you've seen in some ways it's it's kind of the same point. Okay, but it's important to keep in mind, right? In in 
to some extent, if you're estimating one of these models and you're trying to simulate something, how credible your simulation is depends a little bit on how far out of the data you're simulating. It's just, it's exactly the econ, it's the Econometrics 100, 101 example. If, if, if the policy ranges that you're thinking about are way outside the realm of possibilities, it's going to be harder to do rather than if it's a, you know, if it's a relatively smaller marginal change that's kind of within the range of your data. Okay. Does this all make sense? Um, okay. That's the identification of GF. G identification of GR is the same as identification of GF. The second thing, this, this is, I, the, the math of this is awesome, but I don't know if it, make, it, I don't know if it makes it easy to see. But, but, but so, now what, so now what do I want to identify? Now I want to identify, um, I want to identify size. That is, I want to separate psi from GF and GR. Do I always need to do that? I mean, the answer's got to be no, um, or I wouldn't have asked it. So in what case, why, why might I want to do that? And why would I not care about doing that? This matters, because we need two different kinds of exclusion restriction. So if I want to identify something like the average treatment effect in this model, I'm going to, I need to identify epsilon f. And in order to do that, I need this first exclusion restriction that, that, that influences which occupation I take, but not wages conditional on, on occupation. Right? So in that case, in, that, in, in a case like that, um, I need the first type of exclusion restriction. Now I, might, now I want to identify phi. In particular, I want to separate phi from GF. Why would I want to set, and what, for what kinds of questions would I want to separate um, phi from GF? And then what, and what? And I want to see what? How that, you're right. How that, how that affects how that affects participation. So suppose suppose that so let's take the case where F is fishing and H is uh, where fishing is working and, and and hunting is staying home. If I want to estimate a labor supply elasticity, so I want to know how changing the wage affects whether I enter or not. I need to separate GF from from psi. So if I want to estimate something like a wage elasticity, I want to separate this object from this object. Okay, how am I going to do this? And this is where this thing, this, this is where the thing is really cool. I have normalized, I, really cool if, I don't know, maybe, maybe you think I'm really cool not in the way that the cool guys are all doing and it makes everybody want to be a fisherman. Um, really cool if you're a nerdy econometrician. Um, so, so, so we normalize the median of this object to be zero. Okay, what can I identify in the data? From the data, I can identify the level sets for which the probability of being a fisherman is exactly equal to a half. If the value of being a fisherman is exactly equal to a half, and the median of this error term is equal to zero, what do I know? The probability of being a fisherman is a half and the median of this thing is zero, when I condition on values of x, where the probability of being a fisherman is, is equal to a half, what do I know about this object here? This line here has to be zero, right? Because the, the, the probability of being a fisherman is the probability that this thing is less, th is less than this thing. If the probability of this thing is less than this thing is equal to a half, and the probability of this thing is less than zero is equal to a half, then this thing has to be zero. Does that make sense? Kai, you're saying that the bottom term drops out of the first line. The bottom term drops at, at, these, uh, at these values of x, this thing has to be, this, this thing has to hold. And the left side is zero because you're indifferent. You have 5 minus 2 r. You you have rewrite the remaining return. Yeah, no, okay, let me, let me write it more explicitly. I, I want to write it, let me write it as delta u is equal to g plus epsilon, okay? 
and I tell you that the median of epsilon is equal to zero, that means the probability that epsilon is um, less than zero is equal to a half. Okay, and now I tell you um, that the probability that delta u is bigger than zero given g is equal to a half. That means the probability that epsilon is, how, how am I get this, I need to get this, that epsilon is bigger than minus g is equal to a half. But that tells you that minus g has to be equal to zero. Okay, so from these level sets, I can identify, I can identify this thing. Okay, I know this guy, I know this guy, I know that these two things are equal, so that thing is identified. So from this level set, I can identify, I can identify um, this function here, and once I've separated these things out, I know the elasticity. So I know that, I know the way that wages affect, uh, affect the probability of fishing. Okay. Um, Math not, math not so important. The basic idea is super important. If I want to identify, if I want to identify the wage equation, I need an exclusion restriction. I need something that affects whether I fish or not, but doesn't identify wage. If I want the effect of the wage on fishing, I need something that moves the wage around that doesn't affect fishing directly. Okay. So if I want to identify this full model. I need, I need both types of exclusion restrictions. Even the first, mo the first kind of thing, without the Heckman two-step still gives you an answer if you don't have an exclusion restriction. The second thing, even with normal error terms, is not identified. Even with normal error terms, if you don't have an exclusion restriction, the model is fundamentally not identified. Um, finally, the error terms, you can figure out the joint distribution of the error terms. Um, I want to skip that because I want to talk about estimation. Um, estimation. So how do we do estimation? So there, there, so this is, so if you were sleeping, this is more fun, so you can wake up now. Um, so I want to, I want to think about estimating my structural model, and there's basically two different approaches. There, there's, there's basically two different, um, uh, skipping all this. There, there's basically two different ways to estimate my structural model. One thing that I can do, so, so I've, both cases I fully specified in the data generating process. Okay, so both, both of these things, I've told you exactly where the data is coming from. Okay, I know there's no, nothing is left out. The model, uh, the, I, I tell you everything. Um, and once I tell you everything, I can do, do, I can do two different things. Um, and I want to think about the various advantages and disadvantages um, about these two different approaches. The first thing that we can do is maximum likelihood, which is something that you're familiar with, I think. Um, the second thing we can do is simulated method of moments or indirect inference. Well, I, I think I get, well, let me talk about this. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to try to do this without slides. Um, <laughs> we'll see how well this works. Maximum likelihood, you know what it is. Okay, what do we do with maximum likelihood? You write, you write down the model. You can write down the likelihood of the model. We know how to write down the likelihood model. Um, estimate the model, relatively straightforward. What is the, what is the advantage, a big advantage of maximum likelihood? Why should we like maximum likelihood relative to something else? If the model's, yeah, if the model's correctly specified, it's efficient. So if you really believe your model, if you think your model is right, you can't possibly be maximum likelihood. Okay, so that's, that's one way to do estimation. Um, the other way to do estimation is GMM or simulated method of moments. What do you do with what do you do with something like simulated method of moments? What you do with something like simulated method of moments is you calculate a bunch of moments in the data. So I calculate a bunch of means, a bunch of stuff like that. Okay? I can calculate the same thing. Then, then the other, so that's the, those are my moments. That's the data. Now I can do the same thing. If I can simulate my model, I can do the exact same thing with the simulated model. So what do I do when I do something like simulated method of moments? I can, all the parameters that I simulated in GMM, I'm going to simulate with my model, and then I'm going to try to choose the parameters so the simulated values are close to the true values. I don't know if that makes sense. I don't know how well this works without writing down the equations. But does that make sense? Yeah. 
So what does indirect inference do? Indirect inference is essentially, um, is essentially generalization, a generalization of simulated method of moments. What indirect inference, what, what do I know? I know that, I, so I have the true data. I have my model, that I, my, my potential model, which I can simulate from. If the true data is the same as my, it, okay, so I have the true data, I can simulate data from my model. So I know the model, I know the parameters, I know the data generating process. I can use the computer to simulate a sample. So I have my simulated sample over here, and I have my true sample over here. Suppose I do, suppose I have the model right. If I have the model right, and I do something to the true data, what should ha what should, what should ha and I do the same thing to the simulated data, what it should it look like? The same. If I have the model right, what I, I can do anything that I want to the true data, anything I want. Let me do exactly the same thing to the simulated data. If my model is right, I get the same answer. Okay, so the basic idea, the basic idea of indirect inference is Think about whatever the, I do whatever the heck I want to do to this data. I can do exactly the same thing to the simulated data. I'm going to find the value of parameters that makes these two things as close as they possibly can. That's going to give me consistent estimates of the parameter estimates. Okay, intuitively, does that make sense? Okay, so, so maximum likelihood is one way to do it. Indirect inference is another way to do it. And simulated method of moments is the other way, but that's kind of just a special case of indirect inference. To me, it's a special case of indirect inference where the moments, where all of the things that you do to the data are moments, okay? Um, so we can, do, we can do these two different things. So the question, I mean, the, the, so the last thing I was gonna talk about, which I guess we could still talk about in the dark, is what's better? Is it better to do things by maximum likely is it better to do things by maximum likelihood, or is it better to do things by indirect inference? Okay. Well, what's the what's the biggest advantage? What's the biggest advantage of maximum likelihood? It's efficient, right? We know it's efficient. So if we're going to be formal econometricians and we believe our model and we believe that our model is is, um, is absolutely right, maximum likelihood is going to generally be a better thing to do than indirect inference. So when might indirect, why, what's, what's, so what's the biggest difference between something like indirect inference or something like GMM from something like maximum likelihood? There's one, the, what's the first, when you do indirect inference, what's the first thing that you do? You gotta pick your moments. Right? So the first thing that you do when you do indirect inference is whatever, this whatever the heck I do to the data, I gotta decide what that is, okay? So the different, one major difference in maximum likelihood is you're not doing that, okay? You're not doing that, while when you do indirect inference, you are doing that. I would say there's pros and cons of both. What's the, what's the, what's the advantage of not picking your data? I might just have only those moments and not the, the underlying data. Say it again. I might just have only. Oh, that's another thing. Yeah, yeah, no, okay, but, I, but I, suppose you can't, there's gonna be some times where this is much easier. But suppose you could do both. When would it be better to do something like maximum likelihood? Yeah, you're right. If you don't have the moments, yeah. There are cases where our theory make is pretty confident in the form. Or within a certain literature, it's agreed upon, and the point of this research is not to challenge that one. Yeah. So which way, so what would that favor? That would favor, but in either in either case, in both cases, you're making functional form assumptions. The, the moment assumptions, yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's more agreed on than the equation. Yeah. Generally, it isn't, and generally it isn't. So I was going to say one advantage of maximum likelihood is you don't have to defend your choice of moments, right? You're, the data tells you what to do. Um, you're going to do the maximum thing. It's going to be the best. It's going to, f I mean, at some level, it's going to find the variation in the data that's the best at identifying your parameters, and that's what's going to do. So that's the advantage of maximum likelihood. What's the advantage of indirect inference? You're picking your moments. Why, is, why, why might picking your moments be a good thing? They should pick up a theme that, that I've been talking about much of the time. What's the advantage of picking your own moments? Yeah. Maybe some moments are very informative of certain parameters. 
but what does that mean, though? So the, the, the maximum, like, maximum likelihood is going to pick the moments that are most informative. Yes. Yeah. That's where there's two different. So, so, you, so, what was the phrase you used again? The, mo the most informative. What do you mean by informative? I, I, I don't. I, I'm, I, I'm asking you. I don't mean that directly by you. But it depends. If by informative you mean in a statistical criterion, then the maximum likelihood is going to be the best way to do it. It's going to use the data in the in the best possible way you can from a, from a statistical standpoint. But from an economic standpoint. It's, it's, it's generally, you might have a better sense of what you want the model to do. So it, this is related to what I was saying before. Models aren't made to do everything. They're made to do specific things. So you, if you have an idea about what the parameter, what the model's supposed to do, you want to pick parameters that do a good job of fitting those moments. Other moments that you don't think are very important, um, you, den, you, tend to, you tend to not want to wait very much. Okay, and so I can even think about this as a GMM versus a, an optimal GMM versus a standard GMM. The optimal GMM is going to use some statistical criterion to decide which moments are more important. Okay, but intuitively, as an economist, you might have a better sense of what it is you want your model to be doing, and it's completely context specific. Your model is not designed to do everything; it's designed to do certain things. So, for example, if you make if you assume that error terms are normally distributed, normal error terms have really small tails. What that means is that is that what's what's happening what's happening at the tails is really influential in something like maximum likelihood. Okay, it's really informative. The tails are really small. We learn a lot from the tails. But often as an economist, when you're thinking about what part of the data you want to fit, the tails aren't the main thing that you want to fit. So the advantage, one, you know, an adva a disadvantage is people can, you've got to decide this and there's different ways to do it and it might not be robust the way you decide it. But the advantage is you can decide what moments you really want to fit. The purpose of the model is this. Um, and because the purpose of the model is this, I can fit these moments, OK? Um, why maximum likelihood, it's this more abstract thing. You can probably tell that I'm a little bit more, I'm, at least these days, I'm a little bit more of an indirect inference guy um, than a maximum likelihood guy. But then the other thing that you can do, and this gets back to what we were talking about early on and the difference between design-based stuff versus structural stuff, is indirect inference is one thing where I really like where I, it's, a, it's a good way where you can actually combine the best design-based stuff with structural stuff. That is, you can take an experiment, or you can take a regression discontinuity, or you can take an, an instrumental variable. You can pick that as one of your whatever the heck I do to the data, and you can make sure that your structural model can replicate that exact thing. And if you're doing that, now you're, you're being able to leverage the identification advantages that smart people have thought of with creative identification strategies, but use that to identify your structural model. Um, other advantages of indirect inference, um, it's easy to use multiple data sets. It, and often with maximum likelihood, if you're using two different, to totally different data sets, the likelihood function for one data set is going to look totally different than the likelihood function for a different data set because you have different data that you're trying to get the likelihood of. And it's often not even computationally feasible. With indirect inference, it's really simple to take one parameter from this data set, another parameter from this data set. You're just, mat you're just, matching, you're just matching both of them. Another advantage, this is a little bit of what you're talking about. I have a paper that I'm working, I have a paper that I'm working on with a co-author in Denmark. Um, and he's working in Denmark, and we're doing indirect inference. He's working in Denmark, and he uses the Danish data to calculate a bunch of moments. I'm not, I'm not allowed to touch the data, but he can send the moments over to me, and I'm sitting in Wisconsin with my, with my, with my computer trying to estimate my model to fit the moments that he has. We couldn't do maximum likelihood because we need, to, we need, I have the nice computer, he has the nice data, but we can't put the nice data onto the nice computer. So it becomes a, it becomes a way to separate this out is you can get from restricted data that you can't do complicated stuff with, you can get the simple stuff from the restricted data and then choose to match that with the structural with the, with the structural model. So I think it's I mean to me like indirect inference is a way of really combining the the the, the advantages and disadvantages of the reduced or the design base versus the structural stuff. I think it's it's kind of a nice future way to go. So yeah. <laughs>
Yes. Yeah. I mean, in, yeah. I mean, in, in the sense that, and you do that, yeah. So, it's maximum likelihood. Like, if you think you have like a bad proxy, or like you have something that you don't think is the best proxy, and you're a little nervous about it, driving your right. results too much. Kind of like. Yeah. So, so think about. I mean, you can think about this. Forget. You know, like I said, this is kind of just GMM. So, think about just having two instruments. Right, so you have two. Well, you have two instruments. One which you believe a lot. Um, I mean, one is OLS that has, is really precise. One is really one is really loose. This one you believe a lot. This one you don't believe so much. If you do some optimal GMM weighting, it's going to put all the weight on OLS. Right, because it's much more it's much more efficient, and you're going to use whatever thing gives you the smallest standard errors. That's what's going to get the that's what's going to get the, get the most weight. So any kind of sort of GMM criterion function, you think of MLE is similar, it's going to put weight on the stuff that has the most precise estimates. But the advantage of doing standard GMM or, or indirect inference is you can put the weights on the things that you really believe are important. So it's using uh, intuitive, you know more than the statistical program about what moments are more, are more reliable than others. Yeah. So in the, in the simulated natural moments, when we are able to choose different moments that we think are should be matched, then there is still a weighting met matrix. How? Yeah. Um, should we still do that? Should we still? I what most people yeah. So the, so there's this other issue about how you get you, yeah. So you can get the efficient weighting matrix. I think what most people do is use the, something like the diagonal of the most efficient weighting matrix. Um, the advantage of the diagonal is that it becomes sort of scale invariant, so that if I, right, so, so if I, double, if I double the values of a moment, I'm going to double the standard error, and the ratio between the two will, will be fixed. Right, so, because, so, so by just dividing by the, by divi just dividing by the, the standard error, essentially, um, you've normalized things. But then people usually don't, you only use the diagonal version of it. So that's sort of the standard thing to do. Um, it makes things, it makes it clearer what's going on. Um, just the, the weighting matrix means that you can, you can see, so the advantage of using a diagonal weighting matrix is that my criterion function is the sum, is a weighted sum of all of my moments. So if I change this parameter, I, see, I can see exactly where things are changing. It's much more complicated if you're using the efficient things. There's so, and there's, a, there's some papers that suggest like small sample properties aren't very good when you try to use efficient weighting. You don't do a great job approximating those things, so when you wait by them, you can actually make things worse. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I have a question about goal replication. I Well, those are sort of the same thing. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. So, is it possible? I, I, I guess my worry is If it's possible that you could find good things and do go ahead, it's also possible you could find bad things and decide not to go ahead. Yeah, so, yeah. it's just like I worry that since it's so, um, so different I see what you mean, yeah. No, but that, I mean, that is sort of the standard, this is research, right? I mean, it, it, any time that we use one research paper in order to make a policy decision, if the paper wasn't done very well, 
then you might be worried about the policy implications. So ideally, this kind of work, you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't want to use one paper. You would probably want, you would, you wouldn't, I mean, generally, you wouldn't want to write one paper on it and take that and, and use it. You would want to, you would want to try lots of different models and find, find that things are generally, get, get ideas from the many different models. So if you look at, you know, something like monetary policy, which kind of uses, I don't want to call it this kind of model because it's not exactly this kind of model. But those have been refined over years and years and years of playing around with different things and trying lots of different things. So I don't think you want to do one model and make a major policy decision based on one model. Um, I disagree with you a little bit on the minimum wage. I don't think the min. I think. I mean, this is specifically about the minimum wage, but I don't think there's that much dis. There's disagreement about whether it's a really whether it's a really small number or a really 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 small number. I mean, abstracting from the abstracting from the newest stuff on on, on Seattle, but on mo you know, if we look at the Pennsylvania. New Jersey stuff that's super controversial. They're not arguing, they're not arguing, none of those, all of those effects, it's, it's an argument of is it zero or very small? So like something like that, I think I would, I would actually disagree with the characterization. I don't think there's that much disagreement on, on, on the minimum wage stuff. There's implications of how you want to, of what you want to make from it, but I think everybody agrees that moving, uh, that moving from a moving minimum wage from like seven dollars an hour to eight dollars an hour is going to have a very is going to have a small effect on un unemployment, and almost no effect on anybody except for teenage workers. And for teenage workers, we can argue about is it moderately small or very very small so i mean that's where the literature is so so that's the case where i do i mean i i, I disagree that we haven't learned anything with minimum wage i think we were learned quite a bit now now you're talking about a different question is now now but that's all the evaluation problem that's the problem of moving that's a problem of of now, if you think about moving to a $15 minimum wage across the whole country that's a question where we're outside the range of the data Right, and there it's true. You can make different, but I, that, I, might, I might make the argument that's consistent with everything I'm saying here. I, that's probably not non-parametrically identified. Any other qu other qu other questions? All right, we're done. <laughs> Sorry about the light. <laughs> <laughs>